to start. Then I understand we are ready and we can open the meeting. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you at this virtual meeting dedicated to cross-regional cooperation in shaping a resilient economic recovery. The event is the result of the new partnership born between PAM and the Parliamentary Assembly of Turkish speaking countries, Turk PA, following the adoption of a memorandum of understanding in December 2020. I am delighted to welcome all participants, all delegates to Turk PA, PAM, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, PUBSEC, gathered today, including my dear friends and colleagues, Yavan Shir Feiziyev, Secretary General of Turk PA, and Mr. Asaf Ajiyev from PUBSEC. A, work, a warm welcome also to our esteemed guests, in particular the member of the panel, Honorable Battista Leite, Ms. Diana Battaglia, Dr. Edward Kaltrop, Dr. Mukesh Kapilar, Mr. Arnaud Prete and Mr. Khaled Khalifa. Our guests will provide us with insight and ideas on important, feasible, practical national policies and regional cooperation strategies for a sustainable economic recovery post COVID-19. We are very grateful for their presence and we look forward to hearing their thoughts and perspectives. I'm honored to present the di distinguished representative of PAM, Turk PA and PUBSEC, who will now contribute to the high level opening of this meeting. Following to their introductory remarks, I will ask Honorable Giulio Centemero to moderate the discussion of our panel of experts. After the presentations of our guest speakers, the floor will be open for intervention from our parliamentarians. I believe the Secretary General is muted. Sorry. Can you hear now again? Very strange. I, I, will, I, I will start again. One technical note before we start. As a courtesy to all our attendees and speakers, please keep your cameras on and your microphone off muted unless you are speaking. English, French, Arabic, Turkish and Russian interpretation Options are available in the menu at the bottom of the screen. Just choose the flag relative to the language you prefer. The technicians told me that because of some issues, the Turkish flag is today replaced by the German for the Turkish interpretation. Now, please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Honorable Pedro Roque, President Emeritus and Vice President of PAM, as well as he's the serving president of the Second Standing Committee on Economic, Social and Environmental Cooperation. Honorable Roque, please, the floor is yours. Irene? Yes, 
Uh, Honorable Rocky, unfortunately, uh, just call me and he will be a bit late. He had a technical problem. So maybe we could give the floor to... Oh, indeed, indeed. I take, uh, in this case, waiting for Honorable Rocket to solve the technical problem, I will now, it is now my pleasure to present our distinguished guest and co-host from TARC PA, Honorable uh, Jean Bashir Feziev, he has an extensive experience in both the public and private sectors. He is the currently co-chair of the EU-Azerbaijan Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, member of the Committee for International Relations and Interparliamentary Connection of the Mijili Majidis, the Parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan, and member of the Tar PA Commission on Legal Affairs and International relations. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Piazzi. Dear colleagues and participants of the event, it's a great honor for me to greet you on behalf of the Turk PA Chairperson in Office, Mrs. Sahiba Gaparova, Chairperson of the Milli Majlis of the Republic of Azerbaijan, and wish you success in this event of a new format. This is the first joint event between Turk PA and PAM, which is expected to cover wide aspects of cooperation between member countries. And I believe the discussions and outcome of this meeting will be useful for each of its members. Nowadays, dialogue and cooperation is vital in the light of the pandemic, which has paralyzed intergovernmental and interparliamentary relations, as well as world economy. COVID-19 is a global threat which is requiring global efforts and global answer of the world community. Saying this, I would like to mention that Azerbaijan undertook all necessary steps from the early days of the pandemic to keep the situation under control and to ensure health and safety in the country, as well as to unite efforts on a regional and global level. Uh, 10th of April 2020, on the theme of solidarity and cooperation in the fight against COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, Azerbaijan President Ilham Aliyev called an extraordinary summit of the Cooperation Council of Turkic-speaking states in the capacity of its share on the theme of solidarity and cooperation in the fight against COVID-19. In May 2020, Azerbaijan president called for a meeting of leaders of member states of non-alignment movement in the capacity of chairperson of the organization. The necessity of the global cooperation worldwide to fight against COVID-19, especially the support measures for poor countries of the world were the main topics of this international event. President Aliyev initiated a special session of the General Assembly of the UN on the situation of the pandemic in the world, which had been supported by more than 130 states and took place in December last year. Finally, just recently, the Human Rights Council of the UN adopted a special resolution, which urged the states and international health institutions to provide equal, affordable, and fair accessibility to vaccines against COVID-19 for all countries. Despite all the measures undertaken by governments and international organizations, the pandemic is still in force and national economies are suffering from it. Macroeconomic stability in many countries is broken. The main sectors of economy affected by the pandemic situation are tourism, catering, construction, as well as oil production. From this point of view, Azerbaijani economy is also no exception. National economy declined by about 4%. However, there has been growth in non-oil non industry, electricity, gas, and steam production distribution and supply, agriculture, information, and communication sectors of economy. Azerbaijani government was able to adequately respond to the challenges it faced. The funds mobilized against the pandemic has eased the economic downturn, 
maintained macroeconomic stability, supported employment, helped entrepreneurs, expanded social projects, restructured bank loans, and provided guarantees and subsidies. Azerbaijani government assumed key risk and maintained macroeconomic stability by ensuring the stability of the national currency. Despite all of this, the economies of the world, including our member countries, are far from desirable. It's very important for interregional cooperation to prevent the current negative economic trends. In this context, the Parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan, as a member parliament of Turk PA, attaches great importance to interparliamentary and interregional activities. Although international relations were practically impossible during uh, the pandemic, the Milli Majlis not only did not suspend its international activities, but further strengthened them by becoming an active participant in online international conferences. I believe that this, this conference co-organized by Turk PA and PAM will identify prospects for sustainable economic recovery and contribute to inter-organizational relations. We consider it important to intensify mutual visits, meetings and exchange of experience of member parliaments to further expand inter-parliamentary relations. Once again, I wish all success for today's event and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Honorable. Thank you very much. I understand that there are still some, uh, some problems, uh, technical problems. Therefore, uh, is Honorable Giulio Centemero uh, already connected? Yes, I'm here. Okay, in this case, uh, I would uh, suggest that we proceed with uh, uh, the expert interventions chaired by Honorable Centemero. And then when Honorable Pedro Roque join us, he will, at the end of the panel, he can deliver his statement together with the colleagues from uh, PubSec. So I kindly request all members of the panel to be ready and I give the floor to Honorable Centemero, who, is the, who kind, has kindly agreed to serve as moderator of the panel expert. Giulio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. And uh, thanks to everybody for inviting me. I'm uh, currently in Rome, uh, in my office in the Chamber of Deputies. And uh, we're going to start an intense week because we're going to discuss about the recovery plan, which is also, uh, well, recovery is one of the subject of today's meeting. And um, other than thanking you, uh, I would like to introduce you to the expert that will take place, that will take part of uh, our floor. The first uh, expert will be Honorable Ricardo Baptista Leite, uh, is Portuguese is uh, like me member of the uh, network, the parliamentary network at the uh, IMF and World Bank, is actually the vice president and uh, is also a national spokesperson for uh, his party uh, concerning health and is also head of the health department of the Catholic University of Portugal. Then there will be uh, Miss Diana uh, Battaglia, representative of uh, UNIDO. Uh, after Diana Battaglia, Dr. Edward Kaltrop of the European Investment Bank uh, will take the floor. And therefore, uh, Dr. Mukesh Kapila from the University of Manchester and health advisor to uh, the Assembly of the Mediterranean. Uh, Monsieur Arnaud uh, Prete. Uh, deputy head of the Central Asia Unit at the OECD, so very important organization concerning uh, the economy of our countries. And uh, Khaled Khalifa 
we'll close uh, the discussion, we'll close the round table, uh, talking about uh, um, a specific kind of Islamic finance, uh, social Islamic finance, especially concerning uh, refugees crisis. So, uh, before introducing you uh, the first uh, guest, so uh, honorable late, uh, I would like to mention uh, the fact that uh, um, on the blog of the parliamentary network at the IMF and World Bank, I'm sorry to do a bit of advertising to my work, but uh, there's an article I wrote about, uh, about pandemic, uh, about pandemic and about the reflections of pandemic on our economy and especially on uh, the corporate, on companies, because one of the consequences is the erosion of the corporate capital and uh, how can we win, uh, how can we win how can we overtake this erosion well it's uh, up to uh, us the lawmakers to to discuss it i uh, will not reach the conclusions of this this problem uh, of this issue but i will leave the floor to uh, honorable late Honorable Leite, are you there? I am. Thank you. Uh, and, Thanks uh, to you. Thanks to you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for the kind introduction, and Honorable Giulio Centemero. It's a, it's a great honor to, to be here among uh, so many colleagues and friends um, and uh, to be witnessing the, the true spirit of uniting both the, the Mediterranean and uh, Turkic speaking countries. Uh, especially coming from Portugal, despite being here in representation of uh, the chair of the parliamentary network of the World Bank and IMF. Uh, as uh, Julio mentioned, I'm uh, the vice chair in his representation, but uh, personally as, as a Portuguese member of parliament and part of the Mediterranean, very honored to be here. Um, well, very briefly, I, I'd like to say that the truth is, and I think we all feel this in our daily lives, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic has truly shaken the foundations of um, global development and climate action uh, with the reach and rapidity of only comparable to an earthquake, truly. Of course, of course we all know that earthquakes do have aftershocks and, um, and as the world starts to regain its footing on the road towards the sustainable development goals and the, pirate, and the Paris Plame, uh, Climate Agreement, leaders must anticipate um, the coming tremors. We already start to feel them as many leaders, both at national and multilateral level, are saying that many of these agreements are not attainable now that we've gone through COVID. We need to fight against that sentiment. And among the historic challenges for parliamentarians worldwide, what the, the now called K-shaped recovery, that is when certain countries resume economic growth while others lag behind indefinitely, a forecast that is made by many economists, uh, this could actually exacerbate existing rifts and accelerate the fracturing of society along social economics fault lines, making these global goals in the Paris Agreement all but unachievable. So we need to act. And uh, picking up on the three topics that have uh, been outlined for this specific meeting, I'd like to leave some ideas on monetary and fiscal policies on the transition to green and digital economies, and also on the vaccination campaign. As for the monetary and fiscal policies, there is a need for us to understand that we cannot withdraw economic and social supports prematurely to businesses and households, that the financial frailty uh, variates uh, across, but also within countries and understanding the complexities of those variations is of extreme importance as representatives of the people. Importance of finding ways to articulate debt levels with expansive fiscal and monetary policies is of critical importance. And that's of course a role where also multilateral organizations like the World Bank and IMF can play. And a need for transparency and accountability in public spending and debt management. As we will see a lot of public investment across the world, there is need for transparency and accountability to make sure that we are equally effective, not only in rebuilding the world from the, the, the aftermath of COVID-19, but also avoiding an uprise of corruption that we've been trying to fight against over the years. 
As for the transition to the green and digital economies and small and middle businesses and enterprises, we know that, and we've seen it in our day-to-day -day lives, that small businesses, social distancing has highlighted the, the limits of non-digital businesses. And with the lifting of lockdown measures, digital working practices will increasingly become part of what we start to call a new normal. The COVID crisis has stressed the need to accelerate the small and medium enterprises digitization uh, process for uh, overcoming the this, this crisis in the short term, but also for increasing resilience in the long term. And I'd like to emphasize here that when we talk about digitalization, be it within the small and medium enterprises, be it within the public sector, we cannot use digitalization just to perpetuate some of the vices that we've already created or to perpetuate outdated management models. We need to use this opportunity to reform and to make sure that we re-engineer our management models to prepare ourselves for the challenges of the future, to take out the most that we can out of the technology that we now have before us. We need to close the gaps in digital capacity and infrastructure that existed prior to the outcome, to the outbreak. We already had this problem before, it's greater and even more visible now, and to ensure a proper use of financial instruments such as loans, guarantees, and grants to pave the way for SMEs to grow greener and digital. A last note on the vaccination campaigns, as Honorable Julio mentioned, I'm also the head of public health at the Catolica University here in Portugal, but I, by training, I'm a physician in infectious diseases. And this has been an important topic here uh, uh, in multiple fronts that we've been working on. And there is a need to continue to invest in research and vaccine uh, innovation, but I would also say a need to continue to invest in other forms and other uh, sides of this pandemic that we haven't seen so clearly, but that now we are confronting with the challenges such as manufacturing, which is an area where we are too slow, or even in terms of logistical distribution, where we have not in innovated enough. And we also need to continue to invest in terms of treatments, which has been a part that we have left somewhat to the side because of vaccination. And even in terms of testing and genomic sequencing, all of these are of critical importance, not only for this pandemic, but also to prepare us for the future. We need to ensure universal access to vaccines. Uh, we know that the later we are in vaccinating people, the more variants and mutant versions of the virus may appear compromising the efficacy of these vaccines. And the truth is nobody will be safe until everyone is safe. It is unacceptable that the forecasts say that only in 2024, some parts of the world will be vaccinated. If that happens, nobody is safe until then. And we need to make sure that we are capable of accelerating and responding more efficiently, especially if we come to the conclusion that we need a nearly vaccine across the globe. These are major challenges that we face. There is therefore a need to strengthen the use of multilateral mechanisms for vaccine cooperation, the importance of international solidarity and donation of vaccine surpluses. Multilateral organizations can play a very important role in ensuring equitable distribution across the globe. And of course, once again, communication and transparency campaigns to change the perception of the public concerning uh, vaccination, which we see more and more hesitancy growing many times given the role of social media and those that come out with uh, less, um, less favorable visions of uh, vaccination, which undermine our global efforts. So to end, I would say that uh, we at the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF, we have now created a working group on global health. Anyone who, any representative from around the world who would like to be part of such a working group should uh, reach out to our secretariat and we'd be happy to include you in the work we are doing. The truth is we need to come together, find solutions to, to do what we are all calling on for, which is to build back better using the sustainable development goals as that beacon to make sure that we do not lose focus on where we're going uh, over the decade to come, to come to guide us so that we can push away, uh, we can push our, the people we represent away from, uh, from harms, hardships and to build a future where we truly leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leite. Um, I really appreciate your speech. Uh, well, first of all, because I love Portugal and especially I love a specific place in Lisbon. Uh, it's a restaurant called Feitoria. Uh, 
very nice, delicious, I would say. And uh, well, you you raised uh, you raised an issue um, which is connected to the next uh, speaker, which is uh, uh, technology. Uh, how can we use technology to overtake this crisis? We have seen, unfortunately for us European, that countries more developed in technology like the US or uh, other countries, uh, they were more effective in uh, um, giving vaccines. For example, I come from Milan, so uh, one of the most advanced region in, uh, regions in, uh, in Italy, maybe in Europe, and we had problems in booking the vaccines online. Uh, therefore, as I always say, uh, robots will not kill the men. I prefer Asimov than uh, Aldous Huxley in terms of literature. And um, on this happy note, I would give the floor to Miss uh, Diana Battaglia, head of the uh, ITPO of the Italian Office of UNIDO. Uh, please, Mr. Battaglia, the floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Battaglia will talk about digital transition. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very okay. well, loud and clear. Thank you, thank you, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings to all of you. My name is Diana Battaglia. I am the head of UNIDO ATPO Italy, and I am honored to participate today in this parliamentary meeting which aims at enhancing cross-regional cooperation in shaping a resilient economic recovery. First of all, I would like to extend my sincerest congratulations to Mr. Altenbeck Mama Yusupov, uh, Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly of Turkey-speaking countries, and Ambassador Sergio, Sergio Piazzi, uh, Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. Thank you for organizing this important initiative uh, and for the invitation to exchange views with uh, such a remarkable panel. Uh, for those who, who don't know our organization, UNIDO is the specialized agency of uh, United Nations that promote industrial development for poverty reduction, inclusive globalization and environmental sustainability. Together with uh, uh, its network of investment and technology promotion offices, um, um, uh, it plays an instrumental role in supporting developing countries to build their capacity for Industry 4.0. How? Uh, by assisting local organizations and SMEs in creating public-private partnerships with international stakeholders, and formulating innovation management standards to enable industrial transformation and leapfrogging processes. We also assist in the establishment of global knowledge sharing platforms and events in order to raise awareness on the opportunities of Industry 4.0 to accelerate UNIDO's mandate of promoting inclusive and sustainable industrial development. In the last year, the digitalization of industry has been at the forefront of industrial transition. And the current pandemic outbreak is accelerated the fourth industrial revolution even more. In fact, the disruption caused by COVID-19 presents us with an opportunity to build back better also at industrial level by increasing knowledge sharing competitiveness and resilience, reducing supply chain risk for businesses and improving quality infrastructures. In fact, the new technology of Industry 4.0 can offer a wide range of innovative solutions in the fight against the COVID-19 and its economic, social and environmental. For example, Artificial intelligence and big data have been used to assist virus research, vaccines uh, development and data analysis for supporting public policy decisions. Similarly, robotics have played an increasing role in monitoring and assisting patients. 
Another impressive example, Ghana is now the first country using drones to deliver COVID-19 vaccines to rural communities in cooperation with the UPS and other partners. The crisis also exhibits a unique opportunity to leverage the fourth industrial revolution to future proof in productive sectors, foster long-term resilience and build a better future. In some ways, we can already observe that the outbreak and associated lockdowns and quarantine measures have spurred on the mainstreaming of fourth industrial revolution. For instance, migration to cyberspace and remote participation, participation in social, educational, and economic activity is allowing us to reduce the psychosocial impact of social distancing. Big data is also increasingly being deployed in terms of crisis management and predictive learning, allowing real-time database decision-making and a faster and more efficient response. Similarly, the world has witnessed a swift to electronic commerce over physical retail and service provision. Today, it is evident that the new normal in the post-pandemic global scenario will be increasingly driven by 4.0 technologies and their application for inclusive and sustainable industrial development, such as smart factories. However, managing the uh, digital transformation and uh, uh, of manufacturing successfully in the long term can only be ensured through strong public-private uh, cooperation and international multi-stakeholders partnership at the core. So now the question is, are we ready for industry 4.0? In this sense, the cross-regional cooperation will be crucial to unlock the full benefit of digital transformation around the world, especially in developing countries. This will require the contribution of governments, companies, institution, academia, research centers, civil society, and public administration at the national and regional levels in order to share knowledge, connect the international innovation ecosystems, and increase their participation in the global value chains. This might lead to the adoption of clear law and regulations that secure industrial and public safety for industry 4.0 and promote investment friendly environment for SMEs. Initiatives that promote gender equality, women empowerment, social justice, and an adequate uh, educational system focusing on complementary skills, vocational training, uh, university industry linkages and lifelong learning and policy to promote clean and renewable energy sources in order to address and tackle global environmental challenges. In line with its mandate, UNIDO is fully committed to assist its member states in seizing the opportunities arising from the fourth industrial revolution and in supporting the smooth transition toward industry 4.0, regardless on their economic development level ensuring that no one is left behind. For instance, in Turkey, UNIDO and the Ministry of Industry and Technology are cooperating to design and launch a new project aiming at developing the digitalization of industry through innovation ecosystem, building and institution strengthening. The project also has a regional dimension through the establishment of pilot industrial digi digital innovation centers, which will form a regional innovation network for adoption and diffusion of advanced manufacturing technology in Turkey and Western Balkans, contributing to the harmonization of standards and regulation on digital technologies 
and to ensure digital safety and cyber security. In conclusion, um, responding to the challenge of uh, industry uh, for um, um, point zero, we require country and regions to develop an innovation friendly policies, regulations and standard in this new digital world. This will only be possible by understanding the full economic, social, legal and environmental implication on digital manufacturing. In this context, UNIDO supports evidence-based policy advice to ensure a smooth structural transformation towards Industry 4.0. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude once again to delegates of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean and of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Turkey-speaking countries. Thank you for providing us with this unique opportunity to exchange views and share important best practices and how to enhance cross regional cooperation and shape our resilient economic recovery. In the era of the digital transformation in the Mediterranean region and Turkish speaking countries, you need to stand ready to work together and develop a partnership with PAN and Turkpa to ensure the highest quality standard and the upscaling of technological capacity for inclusive and sustainable industrial development and the achievement of the United Nations 2030 Agenda. Thank you. I wish all of you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you, Ms. Battaglia. It was very interesting. Uh, for sure, uh, the targets of the Agenda 2030 are really important and uh, during this uh, period of COVID, um, I, I traveled a lot without moving. Like the, you know, there was a song of Jamiro Quay uh, saying traveling without moving because thanks to this technology, thanks to Zoom and all these platforms, I got to know um, many different countries and many different realities. And I think we can all learn from, uh, from, uh, from them and we can all share uh, best practices. Uh, I would uh, switch to the next guest um, from the European Investment Bank, uh, Dr. Edward Kaltrop. It is true that, uh, especially lately, uh, finance believes in um, not just digital transition, but um, sustainable transition, green economy. I've seen the market caps of many companies, including the uh, very known case of uh, Tesla. And I can say that finance and markets believe in this transition. Uh, what do you think about uh, Mr. Kaltrop? Good morning and, and thank you, Honorable Sentimero. Can, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely, loud and clear. Okay, great. Well, look, I mean, good morning, Excellencies, Honorable Parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a very great honor to be able to address such a, a distinguished audience today. I'd like to use the next six minutes to describe three practical elements, which in my view are worth you considering when designing a green recovery package. And I'll do that from the perspective of the European Investment Bank, EIB, the, the, the EU's Climate Bank, and a long-standing investor in this region. Why green? Uh, perhaps as, as uh, responding also to, to the remarks of, of uh, Honorable Centimero, I mean, green recovery, I think is, for many uh, financial markets, really it's just another name for an effective recovery. Um, one in which you're creating assets that will remain productive uh, and economically efficient over the decades ahead as the global economy moves towards a, a low carbon and more resilient pathway. So in a sense, it's really the only way to create, I would argue, to create sustainable jobs and boost inclusive wealth. Let me turn to these three elements. The first, I would encourage you to consider 
uh, a program of large scale solar power auctions. The wider Mediterranean region is blessed with fantastic solar resources, leading many to speculate that the region uh, may become a new energy superpower in the decades ahead. In any event, economic development will be dominated by mass electrification based around renewables as the cheapest as well as the cleanest source of power. With electricity demand rising, countries need to scale up investment in renewables to go from megawatts into gigawatts. And moreover, based on global experience over the last decade, I think we know very well the basic ingredients to deliver successful results. Robust power purchase agreements, clear predictable rules to allow developers to prepare potential sites, high environmental and social standards to ensure the investments are sustainable within the local community. With that mix, if you're ambitious, I believe you will be rewarded through strong international competition. The world leader remains Portugal with bids as low as 14 euros per megawatt hour. Um, more broadly, you know, prices under 40 euros per megawatt hour are now commonplace, and that's below the operating costs of most conventional sources of power generation. So let's just pause for a second to reflect on what that means in recovery terms. I mean, if, you're, if you act swiftly today, you can have construction start within two to four years. I mean, a direct boost to local jobs. And then looking forward, as we recover more fully from COVID, say five years from now, the investment today will translate into a boost to economic pro productivity as you're lowering power prices um, to consumers in your region. I focused on generation, but I think it's equally important at the same time to think through the long-term strengthening of your power grids, your electricity networks. This is the backbone of the power system to meet the increasing demands for cooling, for electromobility, uh, increasingly from industry. And wearing an EIB hat, I'm very pleased to say we're currently involved in uh, large studies on energy storage, how to integrate that into the grid in Morocco and Tunisia. Ladies and gentlemen, my second message concerns the need to increase resilience of local development to future climate change, extreme heat, reduced water availability in particular. Without more focus actually in this area, investment that we're undertaking today does risk being rendered largely unproductive in the decades to come. So we can build on existing national adaptation plans, but the green recovery therefore needs to pick up on those plans and, and to invest in programs identified under those plans, as well as strengthening planning priorities and improving procedures including design standards. This is occurring, but I have to say as an investor on the ground, we're not yet seeing those sort of top-down plans translate into bottom-up, sort of bottom-up into better designed, more resilient project proposals, even in crucial sectors, such as urban development, water infrastructure, agricultural sector. This is not easy and particularly for public administrations weakened by the crisis. However, support is available, not least from, from several international financial institutions, including the EIB. And one important aspect is to perform climate risk and vulnerability studies to improve the resilience of individual pieces of, of, of infrastructure. And I'm pleased to say that you know, EIB has been active here and, and particularly in the context of supporting investment in water supply projects in Jordan, uh, water and waste treatment, treatment uh, facilities in, in Lebanon and Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, my third message, my final message is not to overlook uh, investment in ecosystems, also referred to as natural capital by economists. 
Ecosystems are storing carbon, they're controlling erosion, regulating water flow, recycling nutrients. These assets depreciate, just like other assets do, if they're misused or overused. And as we've been recently reminded in the report by Sapata Desgupta, we must remain wary of judging recovery and economic growth rather narrowly through the lens of GDP, at least if that means it's at the cost of degrading natural resources. And one example here uh, is the Clean Ocean Initiative used by the EIB and, uh, and partner organizations to support, for instance, cleaning up agricultural runoff into the Egyptian Nile Delta. Let me conclude. Delivering a green recovery will undoubtedly require you know, short-term political choices. I've offered three today for your discussion, solar power, looking at building resilience in to, to, uh, for future climate change and investing into natural capital, all of which I hope you might consider. Making political choices is never easy. Um, I am optimistic, however, that that clear ambition will be rewarded both through stronger, more resilient, more inclusive economic growth in the medium term, as well as referring back to the point of uh, Honorable Centimero, I also think you will be rewarded in the short run through better access to international capital markets um, for sustainable, well-designed well projects. On behalf of the European Investment Bank and perhaps the multinational development bank uh, or community more broadly, let me conclude by offering you all uh, our support to help you build a green recovery in your region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaltrop. And uh, my takeaway today, uh, my your quote that I really like and I will reuse, <laughs> it's uh, green recovery is another name for an, an effective recovery. I think this should be uh, the mantra in our countries, and I think it will be the mantra, especially in this era where uh, uh, I'm talking about the Mediterranean and also the, the large region, uh, Mediterranean and Middle East and North Africa. Uh, yes, we can be uh, an energy superpower, and yes, we can produce hydrogen, for example, between North and South of Mediterranean. There's a nice book written by someone who made his fortune with fossil uh, resources, Mr. Alvera, CEO of SNAM, and now he kind of uh, changed his point of view, uh, noting that there's a lot of sun, a lot of energy can be produced in North Africa, and uh, we have the infrastructure to connect North Africa to uh, Southern Europe, and in Europe, we can definitely produce, for example, hydrogen. So thank you very much. And um, I will go to the next guest, who's a, a doctor, is professor at the Manchester University and health advisor to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. Uh, it's Dr. Mushe, Mukesh uh, Kap, uh, Kapila, sorry, I, I, I spell it uh, wrongly. And uh, to Dr. Kapila, I would like to ask um, what is the importance, what is the added value of cross-regional uh, cooperation campaigns in order to improve uh, our national vaccination campaigns? Dr. Kapila, are you there? Thank you, yes. Uh, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And, uh, dear uh, parliamentarians, it's an honor to talk uh, uh, with you, and I will talk about uh, vaccination. I think uh, the topic of today is, uh, is uh, timely, because to talk about recovery at least brings us uh, hope in the middle of the pandemic. But I hope, uh, uh, at least uh, from a health perspective, you won't mind me saying to also remind ourselves uh, of their old saying that chickens should not be counted before they are, they are hatched. And uh, the pandemic is not over and it will not be over unless we have universal uh, vaccination against the coronavirus. It's the only route out of the pandemic. And that means not just vulnerable older people and those with underlying health problems who suffer most deaths and serious sickness, it means vaccination 
and they should be, of course, at the front of the queue. But in addition, it means universal vaccination for the general public, including eventually children who will also need vaccination to check and reduce general virus spread. Thus, the, thus on the basis of existing scientific knowledge, at least 80% of the population will have to be rendered immune through vaccines. It's also highly likely that the vaccines will have to be renewed annually. This is because first, immunity from available vaccines uh, won't last. Second, because the emergence of coronavirus variants means that the vaccines will need to be continuously updated. And third, because of course, new people are born each year and need to be protected. Therefore, economic recovery that can be sustained in the face of the permanent presence of the virus requires a robust national vaccination system for, and so for the policy consideration of parliamentarians, this implies your urgent attention on several critical fronts. The top priority is to convince and prepare the public to receive the vaccine. While there is much concern nowadays about shortage uh, in vaccine supplies, this is honestly a short-term problem. It will be overcome over coming months as more vaccines are approved and more production facilities come on stream. The much bigger problem is instead vaccine hesitancy, i.e. the large numbers of people in many countries that are reluctant to take the vaccine when available. They are either poorly educated on the benefits and risks or don't trust the authorities or they're misinformed by fake news. To tackle this through education, social mobilization, trust building, and countering anti-vax lobbies must be your urgent first priority. Second, it's important to ensure that the regulatory and, and executive health authorities of your countries only utilize vaccines that are certified safe and effective by the World Health Organization or one or more of its designated and stringent regulatory authorities. These are the EU, the UK, US, Switzerland, Australia, and Canada. Vaccinations that are approved by other authorities that are not on this list uh, should not be approved by your countries. Because many countries are desperate to accept any vaccine from anywhere. And uh, all this is uh, put down in the name of cooperation and uh, such like. But your country should not allow the use of vaccines that are offered by any country through so-called vaccine diplomacy initiatives, unless they have been authorized domestically by one of the above mentioned authorities. To use uncertified vaccines would be risky, undermine public uh, trust even further, and eventually harm economic recovery. The third priority will be to secure a vaccine uh, pipeline. And this of course requires cooperation. That means at a minimum planning and forecasting vaccine demand in a systematic but realistic manner within countries. If countries rush in a panicked way, they will make vaccine nationalism and competition worse, as well as push up prices. Because supplies are currently restricted, a great deal of cooperation is needed, of course, through the UN's COVAX scheme and regional arrangements. Countries can aim to achieve universal vaccination, not instantly, but by the first half of 2022, i.e. next year. That should be good enough and quite feasible. Anything quicker than that is probably unrealistic. And obviously economic recovery plans should be geared accordingly. So patience will be needed with, in the meantime, the maintenance of prevention and public health measures. The, your fourth priority is to make your health systems vaccine ready for what will be, for most countries, the biggest public service delivery program challenge that they will have faced in recent times. While every country has its own traditional way of doing things, the main lesson learned from experience is that decentralized vaccination delivery is better using local doctors and pharmacies that are familiar to and better trusted by communities. It's also best to build on existing vaccination services that are common everywhere. In contrast, specially constructed vaccination arrangements just for COVID-19 and highly centralized and controlled systems bureaucratically are not effective or efficient. And we have seen this now 
in the disaster that is prevailing here in the European Union, where despite having hugely developed economies, the vaccinations are not going well, and neither will economic recovery. So needless to say, the vaccines need to be provided free at the point of uptake. And so there must be an adequate national budget. Fifth, it will be important to give special attention to hard to reach populations. For example, groups like refugees, undocumented migrants, and vulnerable people who don't want to or can't reach the state's official facilities, they will need dedicated outreach effort. This is vital for national herd immunity. As you know already from the popular slogan, no one is safe until everyone is safe, until all are safe. That means that any bureaucratic or legislative obstruction, such as the requirement to show domicile uh, or other papers before receiving a vac vaccination will need to be put aside. And that may need parliamentarians to act. The sixth issue is to foster an open debate in your countries and regions on rapidly emerging policy issues that will test social and political harmony and without which uh, there will be no eco economic recovery. For example, should vaccination be made compulsory? The short answer is no. Experience suggests that coercive pressure is likely to harm the longer term goal of public compliance with health measures, apart from this being an infringement of basic human rights and liberties. In that case, what about compulsory vaccination as an employment condition just for people such as health, social, and transport workers or even parliamentarians, because uh, these roles bring uh, these people into greater contact with vulnerable people. There is some justification for this, but even here, any compulsory measures should be taken reluctantly as a last resort and only if public systems are collapsing under pressure. Even then, such a measure is justified only if there is reliable epidemiological evidence that these settings are causing outbreaks in particular contexts. In short, any coercive measure must be short term and proportionate to the emergency need. Then there is a debate around vaccine passports, uh, because that is now also um, uh, sold as a means for economic uh, opening up. Should those who are vaccinated get greater freedom, such as to travel and mix socially, such as in uh, workplaces, bars, restaurants, and sports venues, would that not help to open up businesses and drive recovery and also create incentives for vaccine hesitants to come forward? Or would that be an unacceptable form of coercion and create, and create greater inequalities in an already unequal world? My own professional opinion is that vaccination certificates will on balance bring more good than cause harm and they are good for economic uh, recovery and the possible harms can be mitigated. For example, by making sure that those who have a medical or other well-founded reason not to accept vaccination are not prejudiced against. In any case, there is a very high probability that vaccine passes will become an international reality sooner than later. That is why cooperation is certainly needed in this case, because we don't want hundreds of national uh, vaccination certificates but one global certificate endorsed by WHO, or at least uh, in, a, in a regional context, uh, like for example, in the uh, countries covered by this, by this meeting. Thus, lawmaker, thus lawmakers like you should have this debate soon on uh, vaccine passes and decide in the context of your own domestic and uh, regional circumstances, the balance to be struck between the domestic and the international spheres. In the short term, uh, if these challenges are successfully met, thanks to your wise leadership, your job is still not done and the guard can't be let down. The pandemic could rebound. And in any case, as the saying goes, a good crisis should never be wasted. It brings opportunity to build longer term arrangements, not just to keep COVID under permanent control, but also to become better prepared for future, future pandemics as well as to address the social factors that created the risks and vulnerabilities that spawned the crisis in the first place. That is a very substantial topic, of course, that needs its own particular meeting. But my conclusion really is that in looking forward to the uh, economic recovery, we should not uh, forget that the current job is not done. And I think measures need to be put in place 
that the pandemic is probably brought under control. And that I believe is the best way to, to get the economies going. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapila. Uh, it was a 360 degrees uh, speech because you cover all the aspects, even the distribution. And I totally agree with the fact that uh, we should use local doctors, uh, local communities, uh, sometimes even uh, uh, using factories or places of uh, work as uh, hubs can be, can be definitely useful as a distribution channel. And I really appreciate it. The, your point of view on, on the uh, vaccine uh, passports. As a matter of fact, uh, we already have something similar, which is the uh, password of the vaccines to go to uh, Africa, for example, for Europeans, because we need to have uh, some specific uh, vaccines. Um, okay, and I would like to introduce uh, our next guest from the OECD, uh, Arnaud uh, Prete uh, and uh, Mr. Prete, uh, we would like to ask you what are the uh, financing mechanism or schemes or instruments that can help us to overtake uh, this uh, period of crisis? Mr. Prete, are you there? Yes, uh, Giulio. Grazie. Uh, je vous en prie. Je vous en prie. Your Excellencies, dear Member of Parliament, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting us to this plenary today that comes, I believe, at a very relevant time when we still oscillate between providing immediate support and planning for the recovery. Please allow me to uh, share my slides now with you. you should be able to see them. Um, so the pandemic uh, has lasting effects on the global economy. Uh, we have discussed it already. And we can see that it has significantly reduced the global activity and trade, uh, which are only coming back to the previous level. Um, in fact, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, we can also see that when we look closer at our regions of interest for today, that the impact on GDP has been severe for all. In the planned recovery starting in 2021, the different path afterwards. This recovery remains largely dependent on the vaccination rollout. And here, uh, I think the, uh, the previous speaker already spoke uh, quite eloquently about it. OECD, we've put together different scenarios um, in terms of world GDP growth. You can see the blue line that was the scenario pre-crisis. You can see the orange that is the current scenario. And you can see different scenarios in red and green, all well, mostly depending on vaccination rollout. So let me emphasize again that vaccination remains the main key to the recovery and governments and parliament should give an extra focus to the issue. Unfortunately, we can see as of today that few countries are well advanced in their vaccination uh, campaign and media, many are lagging behind, especially from uh, low and middle income countries with too slow progress on COVAX. Against this background and to support um, what we can call most positive scenario, large support packages have been designed in most countries. Looking at Central Asia and Caucasus, which is also part of our scope today, uh, support packages have been brought in line with those of OECD member countries, uh, at least in terms of scope, if not in volume. We have observed uh, wide government's major measures, such as regulatory and tax implications, deferrals, financial programs, as well as accommodative policies from central bank. Let me share a couple of examples. Uh, the Anti-Crisis Fund in Uzbekistan, the Kazakh Central Bank that decreased the policy rate from 12% to 9%. And also in Morocco, a program uh, to uh, support informal workers, that was what was called, sorry, it's in French, uh, dispositif de soutien aux travailleurs informels affectés par la pandémie de COVID-19. 
That to say that we also see good practices um, in non-OECD member countries and in countries of the Mediterranean and of the Turkish-speaking countries that are present today. Looking at recovery plans, there are still gaps in financing the green recovery. Current green investment will remain insufficient despite international support. The same can be observed in uh, digital investment. These two topics have been like well covered before me, but let me again emphasize that financing these topics is crucial for recovery. What we've seen across um, times is that virtually all countries have seen their debt level increase with the declining revenues and increase in public expenditure. Most emerging and developing countries have also been hit uh, by the decline in commodity prices and demand in 2020, which fortunately are recovered. Debt levels have increased with a steep difference between 2019 that you can see in blue in this graph and 2020 that you can see in gray on this graph. Debt levels in 2021 should remain at present levels. So this is the green bar or a slightly increase for some countries. What does that mean? And I will spend more time on this for the budgetary and financing aspects of the recovery. Well, first, let me emphasize for the audience today that parliaments have kept a key role in many countries during the pandemic. Special measures and emergency procedures have been used, especially budgetary ones. And legislators have proven accommodating for instance, on flexibility across expenditure lines. So this has been a rather positive evolution, but as the recovery uh, kickstarts, it remains important that what I would call legislative as usual procedures are reinstalled, that emergency measures and programs are re-examined in terms of efficiency, transparency, um, and also potential for the future. Parliamentary feedback and consultations in recovery programs are essential as is the consultation of uh, other stakeholders. When it comes to uh, financial strategies, um, as I said uh, before, um, most countries have used debt as opposed to fiscal consolidation that we had seen in previous crises. International support and instrumental, um, and we've seen different types of this support. Uh, we've seen direct financing and budgetary support uh, that have rescued a number of countries and that has been mostly provided by international financial institutions such as World Bank, IMF, EIB, EBRD. Uh, and this support will stay and increase for the recovery, which is good news for most countries. Let me mention, for example, the record level of commitments made by the EBRD with a large focus on green recovery and investment. A second aspect of this cooperation is a sharing international experiences and agreeing on cooperation, including on financial matters. Uh, this has been central in the support measures and we hope it will continue so, to be so in the recovery, discussing, for instance, tax, measure, tax measures and cooperation. I have mentioned uh, the role of governments and parliaments. I should also say a word about central banks that has as well played a key role with accommodative measures they have decreased interest rates or they are connected, for instance, asset purchasing programs that have been quite effective. Looking at the recovery, it remains crucial that governments together with parliaments continue to move on with structural reforms, including debt and financial management. Here thinking about more result-oriented budgeting, uh, multi-year budgeting, more transparency, but that they also continue to carry on uh, structural tax reforms. And for instance, on tax matters, uh, most countries still need to simplify and improve their tax uh, procedures towards more digitalization. We have seen a lot of progress in the COVID-19 progress and digitalization, and this should continue also in terms of tax procedures. Countries need also to continue to expand the tax base, especially in low-income and middle-income countries. Uh, this means, for instance, ideas like introducing a universal end of the year tax declaration. And also all countries need to continue to get involved in international tax cooperation, particularly the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for tax purposes. Uh, these are really uh, important instruments to effectively tax cross-border activities and finance future programs. 
These efforts alone have helped governments collect over 107 billion USD of taxes over the past decade. So please allow me to end my presentation with this call for increased cooperation, as I believe is, is the objective of today's session and should be the objective of future efforts on many topics from vaccination to digitalization, green investment and financing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arnaud. Um, one, one small question, because it could be really interesting for uh, parliamentarians. Uh, is the OECD releasing any uh, studies or suggestions or guidelines uh, um, for the recovery? Uh, it would be interesting to see, for example, what reforms are proposed for taxation. Um, yes, indeed. So I see I cannot start again my video, but okay, I'll continue speaking without the video. Uh, just to okay. say, yeah, yes, a first series of uh, papers and studies have been issued uh, last year, especially on taxation. They discuss a lot of short term measures, uh, tax deferrals, uh, tax digitalization, uh, tax reliefs, and I would encourage for immediate support to look at it. Uh, we have been also thinking, of course, about uh, long-term planning for the recovery. Uh, of course, not uh, advising on uh, tax increases or tax uh, immediate tax uh, compensation. And for this, we release again uh, new studies uh, in the upcoming weeks about tax policies. When it comes to uh, the overall economic recovery, I can only encourage you to uh, look at the most recent uh, OECD interim economic outlook that was presented by OECD chief economist Lawrence Boone. A couple of weeks ago, you will see that some of my points or graphs are coming from precisely this report. Very well, very well. If you could share with our secretariat these studies, that would be great, and I think all the parliamentarians would would enjoy. Uh, I will uh, uh, go to sure. the next guest. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I will go to the next guest, uh, Mr. Khaled. Khalifa, uh, same name of a uh, famous uh, Syrian poet, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but Mr. Uh, Khalifa will not talk about poetry, but uh, Islamic finance. And um, the topic is uh, how can Islamic finance help us uh, during this recovery? Thank you, Mr. Khalifa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Centenero. Indeed, I share the name uh, of the great Syrian novelist, actually, <laughs> Khaled uh, Ah, Sorry, novelist, many, not poet, sorry. Uh, he's, a, he's a novelist yeah, and uh, many other, actually, celebrities in the, in the Middle East. Uh, I would like to thank uh, also His Excellency uh, Sergei Piazzi for the uh, uh, invitation and uh, good morning to all of you, uh, Excellencies, uh, Parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, the presentation of uh, Mr. Prete gave me a good segue into what I would like to speak to you within the coming five, six minutes, uh, Islamic philanthropy, because uh, the OECD actually issued a very interesting report in November 2020 about the uh, potential of Islamic philanthropy and how it could contribute to the achievement of the uh, sustainable uh, development goals. And yesterday, uh, we in UNHCR launched the annual Islamic philanthropy report for 2020, the year that we uh, concluded. And I am very glad to report that we uh, witnessed actually an increase in contributions despite the slowdown uh, in the economies, in the world of the economies and all the repercussions of uh, COVID-19. We recorded 61.5 million in 2020 compared to uh, 43 million in 2019. That's about 43% uh, increase. And uh, this kind of indicates that this sector has a lot of potential. This money went to assist 2 million 
uh, refugees and internally displaced people around the world. Uh, in order to probably uh, justify the topic itself and why we speak about Islamic finance now, let me zoom out uh, a little bit. Uh, Islamic finance assets have increased between 2012 and 2019, that's five years, uh, by uh, from $2.8 trillion to close to $3 trillion. Uh, and that includes the last year, despite also the slowdown, when most economies and most tools retracted, we still witnessed 1% growth in Islamic uh, finance. So there must be something uh, interesting or unique happening when it comes to Islamic finance compared to conventional uh, finance. Uh, we are expecting the Islamic finance assets to reach about $4 trillion dollars by 2024, taking into consideration also the impact of uh, COVID-19 on global uh, economies. If we try to uh, dissect Islamic finance and what we are talking about, Islamic banking, that's the uh, banks that follow uh, Sharia compliance rules in its dealings, constitute about 81% of this total with a total value of $2.3 trillion uh, last year uh, only. Sukuk, which is the Islamic bonds or the uh, Islamic way of doing uh, traditional bonds, constituted about 12% with a total of $348 billion in 2020. The Kaful, which is the uh, Islamic way of doing insurance as well, and microfinance, constituted a small uh, margin of one to two percent. And that's the area where we see a lot of growth uh, coming uh, up in the future. We have 2,500 Islamic banks in the world, and uh, that's a huge number. They are operating in 108 countries, Islamic institutions, let me say, banks and uh, insurance companies that follow the uh, Sharia uh, and the Islamic rules in that regard. 10 countries uh, only account for about 95% of the Sharia compliant assets worldwide. Those countries are Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, the UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Turkey, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, and Bahrain. We see a concentration in the Asia Pacific region, about 25% of the global Islamic finance uh, uh, market is concentrated in uh, the Asia Pacific, but we also see an increase in Europe uh, per se. Uh, Luxembourg issued its first uh, Islamic sukuk in uh, 2014, and that sukuk was $200 million. It reached uh, its maturity in 2019, and we see an increase also in uh, the banks, the number of banks in Europe that uh, dedicate a section for Islamic uh, dealings. If we uh, speak about the main differences between Islamic uh, finance and traditional finance, in Islamic finance, we are not talking about uh, money as a commodity. Money uh, from the perspective of Islamic uh, finance is an, uh, a means to an end, not an end itself, which means you are not allowed to trade in money per se. Investments must be backed by solid uh, assets. Uh, the, uh, there are certain sectors that are not allowed uh, for investment. And I think in many developing countries and uh, underdeveloped countries, we can certainly do without those uh, sectors that include uh, trade in uh, alcohol, trade in drugs, trade in weapons, and any unethical uh, uh, trade methodologies. Profits and loss are shared equally between the financier and the uh, investor, which provides a very good opportunity uh, in underdeveloped countries and uh, least developed countries, because the majority of the people are unbankable, 
and uh, more than uh, the number of bankable people, we have a huge number of people who are not creditable. They do not have access to uh, loans that can enable them to start small and micro uh, enterprises. Gambling, of course, is uh, prohibited. Speculation is prohibited, which uh, can create some more stability in uh, markets. Uh, riba, which is the interest in uh, traditional finance, is also not uh, permitted. And that means the creation of debts based on interest is not there when we speak about Islamic finance, and this can lead also to another source of uh, stabilization in the market. The uh, model that we would like to present here, we are not talking about Islamic finance because it is Islamic. We are talking about it because it's a model that can be replicated, whether in Islamic countries, Muslim countries, or non-Muslim countries. It is just a model, the name, uh, is not an indicative of the substance in that regard. And this is uh, probably the message that I would like to leave you with. Uh, we need to look at Islamic finance and is Islamic philanthropy with a new lens, from a new perspective, uh, disregarding the association with the word Islamic per se. We need to look at Islamic philanthropy and Islamic finance as a model that can be replicated regardless of its uh, ethical background and regardless of where it came uh, from. I think there is a lot of uh, scope, a lot of room for improvement in that uh, regard. And I encourage uh, all of you to really read this uh, OECD report about the potential of Islamic philanthropy on the achievement of the SDGs uh, going forward. I think there is a role for lawmakers worldwide to widen the horizons that would enable innovative finance, including Islamic finance, including other uh, methods of finance that depend on faith uh, in order to uh, keep no stone unturned. That's what we need in this uh, period. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, periods where the economy slowed down and the only way to solve those problems were uh, actually to resort to innovation. Uh, it's just an invitation to uh, all of you to consider this sector uh, going uh, forward. We definitely in the United Nations see an increase in interest by all organizations that would like to explore the potential of Islamic uh, philanthropy per se, uh, like Zakat. Uh, this is one of the tools that we utilize big time in UNHCR. And according to the Islamic Development Bank, we are talking about a minimum of $350 billion per year uh, circulating in the Muslim world. This can solve a lot of social uh, problems, especially if we are talking about the impact of COVID-19, taking into consideration that the amount required by the United Nations to respond to the humanitarian uh, issues around the world it is only $35 billion. So we are talking tenfold more than what is required to address the most dire humanitarian needs around the world. Uh, that's the message I would like to leave you with, and thank you uh, once again for the opportunity to present on this topic. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mr. Uh, Khalifa. It was really interesting. And uh, it is true that uh, we don't have to leave any stone unturned. Uh, I've been um, reading uh, books and essays also about uh, Islamic finance, which is uh, an ethical finance. And um, I would like to recall to all the participants that as a PAM, as Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, uh, in particular with the economic panel within the economy committee, we um, discuss and uh, we are building a research center and a project um, also about innovation in finance. And in specific, we talk a lot about FinTech because it is true that, especially in remote areas, 
um, we have to close the gap. We have to close the gap. We have to give access to finance and to other services to the local populations in order to uh, decrease uh, inequality in the world. So uh, you were the last speaker. So uh, the panel, the round table uh, is going to, to close right now. So I would call Secretary General Piazzi to jump in uh, to take the floor from me for the following parliamentary debate. Sergio, are you there? I'm there. Thank you very much, Honorable Centemero. I would like to thank uh, you for the excellent uh, moderation, and I would like to thank our expert for presenting valuable perspective on the lesson learned, future challenges, best policy practices, and recommendation for a resilient economic recovery across our regions. Uh, the insight have provided a very useful framework for our policymaker, our delegates, to think about targeted measures for delivering green and digital transition and for fostering international regional cooperation in the economic field and in the medical field. Now, before we start with the, the debate, uh, I understand that we have solved the technical problems, and I will ask now briefly to intervene uh, President Pedro Roque, who is the President Emeritus of PAM and is also the President of the Second Standing Committee, our Economic Committee. Immediately after him, I will ask my friend, our friend Asaf, the Secretary General of PAMSEC, to, uh, to intervene. Uh, Honorable Roque, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sergio. Uh, my apologies to everyone uh, because of those problems. I have missed the slot, so I, I will address now to you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. This parliamentary meeting, uh, by the way, very good until, the, until now. Uh, is the very first time that our organizations are promoting a joint event. A few months ago, despite the pandemic crisis, the Parliamentary Assembly of Turkic Speaking Countries, Turk PA, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, PAM, decided to establish a structured and constructive cooperation on issues of common concern. The present meeting is the first example of the fruitful dialogue that our partnership means to establish. Dear friends, for more than a year, COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and distressed our societies and is still ongoing. In our regions, as globally, the crisis is putting extreme pressure on economic growth, social and financial stability. Our countries are facing unprecedented levels of unemployment, lowering in the purchasing power of our citizens, and in some cases, risks of major food crisis. Vital segments of our economies, such as small and medium enterprises, and mainly cultural and tourist sectors are now being exposed for more than a year to strict lockdowns global restrictive measures, and they struggle every day for survival. Today, our task as policymakers is paramount. We need to develop effective and forward-looking solutions in order to address the economic and social costs of this pandemic. Accordingly, cooperation among our countries and regions is the best way to be sure that we can emerge successfully out of this crisis. No one can achieve this alone or in isolation. The past year has demonstrated how interconnected our societies are. The path towards a sustainable and prosperous future in our countries goes through stronger cross-regional partnerships. The goal of both Turk PA and PAM are and made evident by this event in the bridge regional perspectives to identify and promote policies and legislative practices 
that maximize successfully strategies. Dear friends, more than 12 trillion United States dollars have been globally pledged to recovery efforts, the equivalent of 15% of global GDP. We stand at a crossroad. Our choices today will determine the resilience of our societies in the coming next decades. Three strategic policies areas on the longer term will be determinant. First, the transition toward a climate neutral economy. According to science, if over the next five years, one tenth of the global resources mobilized for the recovery will be invested in climate positive policies, the world could be put on track to meet the objects of the COP21 Paris Agreement, creating new jobs and major economic opportunities. This is an extraordinary opportunity, a green reboot based on innovation, circularity and decarbonization is our best chance to mitigate the ongoing climate emergency. Our countries should join the global coalition for net zero emissions and align national recovery efforts with the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We strongly believe that climate action is a win-win situation, both good for the economy and the planet. For this region, PAM firmly advocates a carbon added tax for ending fossil fuel subsidies. Cooperation among all, all partners will be crucial to achieving a smooth transition to a renewable energy future. Second, the acceleration of digitalization. Recovery plans oriented to digital innovation are a great chance for our governments to launch new industries, boost job opportunities, and stimulate research and technological development. Towards this aim, PAM acts as an open forum for policy exchange to facilitate the establishment of digital services and platforms, including digital entrepreneurship and e-government in member countries. Interparliamentary collaboration across regions play a key role. Closer synergies among lawmakers from TRUPA and PAM countries will be essential to improve regulatory convergence and strengthen infrastructural and digital networks across the Euro Mediterranean, the Gulf, and the Central Asian regions. Small and medium enterprises, which in all our countries have been severely hit by the economic disruption, can particularly benefit from digital transformation. By going digital, this vital business can improve their competitiveness and extend their access to international markets. Third and last but not the least, effective vaccine campaigns. The COVID-19 crisis has increased transboundary interdependencies. No inward looking national measures will be enough if cooperation on vaccination strategies is absent. We cannot let vaccine nationalism deceive us as clearly stated by the World Health Organization, none of us will be safe until everyone is safe. The global vaccination campaign represents a dominant moral test for the international community. PAM is indeed working with United Nations agencies and major international and financial institutions in order to promote solidarity actions in favor of those countries that have not yet started vaccination programs. Dear friends, with today's event, we want to reaffirm that parliamentary diplomacy is key to create real and cohesive policies in all sectors. It is because of this shared belief that Turk PA and PAM as well as our friends from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, have come together to learn from each other and exchange with top-level international experts.
only united we can achieve the transformative changes that we all wish to see in our societies and defeat COVID. Dear friends, I thank you all for your attention. Honorable Roque, thank you very much. And as you mentioned, uh, in organizing this conference, we thought that we could not, not have with us our friend, the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, as is key in the cross between the Mediterranean region and the Turkish speaking country. And for this reason, I have the pleasure now to ask our dear colleague Asaf Ajiev to address this meeting. Asaf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sergio. I'm very happy to see all of you. And so it's an honor and privilege for me to have this online intervention and to express my gratitude for to organizer of this meeting, the Turkpa and PAM. And I would like to express also my deep thanks to my very good friend, Ambassador Sergio Piazza, for invitation to have a talk here. I'd like to congratulate these two assemblies which bring together different countries with various traditions and most important different religions for having the idea of organizing such an interesting joint meeting. I'd like to say a few words about PAPSEC, which was established in 1993, bring together nowadays members of the parliaments from 12 member states of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, comprising 77 MPs, revealing itself as a unique political forum of interparliamentary dialogue in the Black Sea region. In June of this year, the Parliament of North Macedonia will join PAPSEC and there will be 81 MPs from 13 countries. The main object, objective of the PAPSEC is to achieve a high level of regional economic cooperation and to transform the Black Sea region into a zone of peace, stability, and prosperity. The Black Sea region is a bridge between Asia and Europe, being situated at the crossroads of major transportation roads from east to the west, for instance, Silk Road, and from the north to the south, Viking Road. At the same time, this region is rich in energy resources and in important energy roads from the Central Asia and the Caspian region being an outstanding source of oil and gas for Mediterranean Sea and also for the world markets. Cooperation is the most important issue for our future and prosperity. And I would say that cultural values play an important role in cooperation. In this regard, two assemblies, PAM and TURPA, are unique organization because they can unite different nations with different culture and tradition, and most important, with different religions. PAM already unites different nations with different culture, different traditions, different religions, Muslim, Christian, Jews, and other. Turkey can in future to unite various nations with different religions. Turkey Gagaus have Christian religion, Turkey Karaim have Jewish religion, Turkey Buryats have Buddhism, and so on. This is a unique fact and can be based for our for cooperation. It is worth underlining here the fact that two countries of Turkpa, Azerbaijan and Turkey, are members of the PAPSE. And five, five members of the PAPSEC, Albania, Greece, Romania, Serbia, and Turkey are members of the PAM, which confirms and can be based for our good re relations. The PAPSEC has signed a memorandum of understanding with PAM, in which has been strengthened the good cooperation between the two assemblies with the possibility to participate in each other meetings. Turkpa has observer status in PAPSEC, and vice versa. Thus, there is a good base for our triple cooperation. Today, the Black Sea region is a huge project 
In the Black Sea region, the huge projects are implemented in the energy field. I'd like just to underline one of them, South Gas Corridor, which includes two parts. Come up, Trans-Anatolian pipeline, gas from Caspian Sea is delivered to Turkey, and TAP, Trans-Adriatic pipeline, gas from Caspian Sea through Turkey is delivered to Greece, Albania, Italy, and other European countries. These mentioned countries are member of PAM. This example confirms our good cooperation and we must develop it. Another field of cooperation can be information technology, which completely changed our world. In the first part of 20th century, the most rich sector in the world was energy sector, which is estimated today around 4 trillion US dollars. Later in the second part of 20th century, the banking sector outstripped energy sector and today is estimated around 4.5 trillion US dollar. But in the 21st century, IT sector, I would say, became most important and rich sector and today is estimated around 5.5 trillion US dollar. Maybe this fact became the reason that in Davos Forum in 2000, the main slogan of 21st century was proclaimed as economics and informatics. Such PAM members like Italy, France, Israel have deep achievements in this field, and we can extend our cooperation to this field. I will look to the countries Finland, Denmark, Singapore, Japan, thanks to successful producing and using IT, they achieve a high life standard. We can also have cooperation in the tourism sector. <clears throat> For instance, Turkey, Italy, France, Greece. Greece are countries having deep experience in tourism sector. Now some PAPSEC and Turkpa countries, for instance, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, are needed in development of tourism. I think it would be very useful to organize some joint PAPSEC, PAM and TURKPA event in tourism field and share with experienced countries. PAPSEC is ready to organize joint event between three assemblies and we are ready to be a host of such event. The other is field where we can have deep cooperation and we have to use such possibility. Of course, pandemic restricted our activities but despite of it, we have to continue our cooperation, at least online regime. I am optimist and hope that in a short time, we'll win pandemic and soon can see each other and continue our cooperation. I'd like to conclude my remarks by emphasizing that we are all one family and we must bring our contribution to build a common future where peace healthy, prosperity, and stability should govern not only our region, but the world. And all seas in our region, Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, Jane Sea, Caspian Sea, should not divide us, but must unite us. Thank you very much for invitation and for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your words. Thank a lot for your suggestion, which indeed is a great idea. And the tourism <coughs> is a key element of all the economies of our countries. Indeed, we, we, we must work on that. Thanks a lot. Now, the, the, this portion of our meeting will consist of the debate with intervention from our parliamentarians and the guests. I have already a list of MPs which have registered to take the floor. And the first one is uh, our distinguished head of the Turkish delegation to PAM, Honorable Atay Uslu. The floor is yours. Sayın Ee, sayın Delegasyon, e, değerli parlamenter, her, e, sizlerle uzaktan da olsa, sanal da olsa bir arada olmaktan büyük bir memnuniyet duyuyoruz. Covid-19 
19 salgını tüm insanlığa karşı herhangi bir ayrım gözetmeden küresel bir tehdit olarak karşımıza maalesef çıktı. Bu salgın başta e, sağlık sistemi olmak üzere, en gelişmiş ülkelerdeki sağlık sistemi olmak üzere e, hayatın tamamını etkiledi. E, bir taraftan da salgına karşı alınan önlemler hem sosyal hayatımızı hem ekonomik hayatımızı etkiledi. Yani hem Covid ekonomimizi etkiledi hem Covid'e karşı aldığımız tedbirler bizleri ve ekonomileri sarstı, etkiledi. Covid-19 virüsü bize bir şey öğretti ama. Dedi ki hepimiz aynı gemideyiz. Bunu bir kez daha bize hatırlattı. İnsanlığın ortak bir kader birliği içinde olduğunu bize hatırlattı. Hepimizin güvende olmadan kimsenin güvende olmadığını hatırlattı. Bu virüs çünkü sınır tanımıyor. Herhangi bir sınıra takılmıyor. Sınır tanımadan hepimizi etkiledi. Biz Türkiye olarak en baştan bugüne kadar salgınla mücadele konusunda dinin güçlendirilmesi için adımlar attık. Atmaya da devam ediyoruz. Ee, ne kadar adım varsa bu konuda işbirliği varsa onlara da destek veriyoruz. Bu toplantıda güzel istişareler oldu. Ben hem Türk dili konuşan ülkeler parlamenterlerine hem Akdeniz Parlamenterler Asamblesi'ne hem de katılımcılara teşekkür ediyorum. E, biliyorsunuz bundan sonra bir toplantımız tekrar olacak. Ekim 2021 tarihinde. Bu toplantı ekonomik toparlanma konulu toplantıyı Antalya'da inşallah Türkiye'de yapacağız. Biz Antalya'da düzenlenmesinden büyük bir memnuniyet duyuyoruz. Sizleri bir kez daha toplantıya davet ediyoruz. Ev sahibi olmaktan büyük bir memnuniyet e, duyduğumuzu ifade ediyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, tabii COVID en az gelişmiş ülkeleri çok zor durumda bıraktı. Hem koruyucu ekonomik politikalar hem aşıya ulaşma konusu hakikaten onlar için çok zor. Biz tabii kalkınma ve insani yardım konusunda Türkiye olarak elimizden gelen desteği göstermeye devam ediyoruz. Türkiye son 10 yılda kalkınma yardımlarını ve insani yardımlarını 10 kat arttırdı. Yine bu süreç içerisinde 12 uluslararası kuruluşa ve 157 ülkeye tıbbi malzeme konusunda yardımda bulunduk. Yine yardımda bulunmaya inşallah devam edeceğiz. Son iki konu var. Onları da ifade ederek konuşmamı sonlandırmak istiyorum. Birisi Süveyş kanalında bir biliyorsunuz tıkanma ortaya çıktı. Bir gemi nedeniyle. Bu tıkanıklık nedeniyle e, ekonomik olarak ciddi bazı sorunlar yaşadık. Bu şunu gösterdi. Aslında yeni kanallar, yeni yollar e, açılması gerekiyor. Ticaretin gelişmesi anlamında. Türkiye Hazar geçişli Doğu Batı koridor girişimi, Bakü Tiflis Kars demiryolu girişimiyle bu bağlantıyı arttırma niyetinde. Modern bir İpek yolu e, canlandırma için hem bölge ülkeleriyle biliyorsunuz hem de Türkiye e, Avrupa ile ciddi bir gayretin içerisinde. İnşallah bu modern İpek yolunu da canlandıracağız. Yine Türkiye içerisinde Marmara Ray, Boğaz üzerinde yeni köprüler, Türk geçitler, işte büyük havalimanıyla biz aslında dünyanın e, da istifade edebileceği yeni kanalları, yeni yolları açmaya çalışıyoruz. Diğer bir konu son olarak da şunu ifade edeyim. Bugün dünyada en çok mülteci barındıran, sığınmacı barındıran ülke konumundayız. 3.6 milyon Suriyeli ülkemizde yaşıyor. Yine onun dışında 400 bine yakın farklı statülerde e, koruma arayan mülteciler Türkiye'de. 4 milyon mültecinin gıda ihtiyacını, sosyal yardımlarını, sağlık ihtiyaçlarını, eğitim ve istihdam gibi konulardaki ihtiyaçlarını gidermeye çalışıyoruz. Bu konu dünyanın önemli konularından birisi. Bu konuyla beraber değerli katılımcılar maalesef e, bir ırkçılık ve İslam karşıtlığı virüsünün dünyada yayıldığını görüyoruz. Bir tarafta korona virüsü yayılıyor, bir tarafta ırkçılık ve göçmen düşmanlığı virüsü yayılıyor. Bu virüsün ikisi de ekonomileri, bu ikisinin virüsün ikisi de birlikte yaşamı ciddi bir şekilde etkiliyor. Biz özellikle ırkçılık ve İslam düşmanlığı konusundaki rahatsızlığımızı her platformda dile getiriyoruz. Bu endişemizin yeteri kadar dikkate alınmadığını düşünüyoruz. Ötekileştirici, göçmen düşmanlığını ortaya çıkaran, ırkçı saldırılara ortam hazırlayan bu dilden dünyanın hızlı bir şekilde uzaklaşması gerekiyor. 
Yalnızca 2019 yılında Avrupa'da 52 tane camiye saldırı yapılmış. 2020'de 120 tane olmuş. 2021 yılında içerisinde de bu camilere saldırılar giderek artıyor. Göçmenlere karşı işlenen saldırıların da arttığını görüyoruz. Avrupa'da on binlerce saldırı var. Yalnızca Almanya'da geçen yıl 3000 göçmen düşmanlığı ve göçmenlere yönelik saldırı ortaya çıkmış. Arkadaşlar hakikaten bu tehlikeli bir durum. Hani koronavirüse karşı aşıyla önlemler alabiliyoruz. Ama yabancı düşmanlığı, nefret söylemi, ırkçılık vücuda girerse buna karşı tedbirler almamız çok zor olabilir. Emin olun belki koronayı çözebiliriz ama ırkçılık daha da büyürse, göçmen düşmanlığı daha da büyürse, İslam, İslam düşmanlığı daha da büyürse bunun tedavisi çok zor olur. Onun için bu virüs bu vücuda yerleşmeden yani ırkçılık virüsü vücuda yerleşmeden daha katı önlemler almamız gerekiyor. Kutsal kitabımıza karşı İsveç'te, Norveç'te açık açık saldırılar oluyor. Bunlar bizi üzüyor. Her zaman şunu ifade ediyoruz. Bu konularda daha dikkatli olmamız gerekiyor. Hepimiz uluslararası kuruluşlar birlikte yaşama konusunda ciddi adımlar atmamız gerekiyor. Sığınmacılar, mülteciler konusunda işbirliği yapmamız gerekiyor. Kaynak ülkelerdeki problemleri Birlikte çözebiliriz. Kaynak ülkelerdeki problemleri azaltabiliriz. Veya sığınmacıların geldiği ülkelerdeki entegrasyon ve uyum çalışmalarını arttırabiliriz. Sığınmacılar için ortaya çıkan yükü yalnızca komşu ülkelerin üzerine bırakmadan paylaşabiliriz. Bu konuda adımlar atabileceğimize inanıyorum. Siyasetçilerin, medyanın, ırkçı ve yabancı düşmanı söylemler konusunda daha duyarlı olması, daha güçlü tepkiler vermesi gerekiyor. Avrupalı dostlarımızın, özellikle Avrupalı dostlarımızın mevzuat konusunda da bu konuda adımlar atması gerektiğini düşünüyoruz. Toplantımız sonunda ben yine 2021'de Antalya'da yapacağımız e, o toplantıya hepinizi beklediğimi ifade ediyorum. Bu güzel toplantı için emeği geçen herkese teşekkür ediyorum. Selamlarımı ve saygılarımı sunuyorum. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Honorable Uslu, also for the very kind uh, invitation. And uh, now one comment. I have a long list of members of parliament who have requested the floor. And uh, our meeting is due to last for the next 40 minutes. For this reason, I would recommend, in order for everyone to have the opportunity to take the floor, to limit your intervention to the key messages in, in, in two minutes. Now, my uh, next uh, uh, member of parliament to, who has requested the floor is Honorable Salahidin uh, Aydarov from the parliament of the Kyrgyz Republic. Honorable Aydarov, the floor is yours. Hello, участники сегодняшнего мероприятия. Рад приветствовать вас. Сегодняшняя тема весьма актуальна для всех стран, подвергая все новым штаммам ориентирования населения коронавирусной инфекцией и новым карантинным мерам. В один из отдельных странах все же наблюдается постепенный рост экономической активности, в том числе и в Кыргызстане. Некоторым торможению роста экономики страны поспособствовали политические события в Кыргызстане в октябре прошлого года. Однако с возвращением правого поля, а также принятием болевым мерам, страна постепенно выходит из кризиса и идет процесс восстановления экономического развития. По, по данным национальных международных экспертов и институтов, в стране произошли сильнейшие падения ВВП за 26 лет почти на 9%. Особенно сильно пострадал сектор среднего и малого бизнеса. В условиях экономических шоков расходы на продовольственные товары резко упали что повлекло за собой снижение объемов розничной торговли на 15%. Этому также способствовало закрытие всех торговых точек и невозможность обслуживания клиентуры на местах. Ответом на данную ситуацию является активный рост онлайн-торговли и предоставления услуг. Для обеспечения защиты прав интересов сторон электронной коммерции необходимо было разработать соответствующую нормативную базу. В рамках деятельности комиссии ТРУПА по экономическому сотрудничеству был разработан проект модельного закона об электронной коммерции, 
Данный проект направлен на парламент там, тюрк, стран Тюркпа. На рассмотрение и в ближайшее время планируется онлайн рабочая встреча экспертов парламентов для обсуждения этого модельного закона. Еще одним пострадавшим сектором экономика оказался туристический, который в этом году намеревается улучшить свое положение с открытием пляжного сезона, а также иных горных туристических развлечений. По подсчетам туристических сектор из-за пандемии потерял около 80% прибыли. Устойчивому росту ковидному экономическому развитию также способствовало открытие государственных границ и воздушного пространства в стран для международных авиарейсов. Казахстан – одна из первых стран в регионе, которая открыла свои границы для грузовых и пассажирских перевозок. Начиная с 4 декабря 2020 года, Кыргызстан разрешил всем иностранным гражданам и лицам без гражданства, без каких-либо ограничений, весь в страну с соблюдением требований алгоритмов действий на непосредственные коронавирусные инфекции в стране. Президент Кыргызстана Джапаров поручил правительству принять комплексный антикризисный план по поддержке национальной экономики и в первую очередь повысить уровень свободы предпринимательства, поддержать и защищать интересы частных предпринимательных инвесторов. Вывод экономики из кризиса, также дальнейшее устойчивое восстановление требует всестороннего похода. Необходимо отметить, что устойчивость экономики на данном этапе должна быть сопряжена с озеленением экономики, использованием чистых и возобновляемых источников энергии, уменьшением негативного воздействия на окружающую среду. Гидроэнергетика, так же, как и другие альтернативные источники энергии, является важным аспектом, которому должно уделяться особое внимание. Реализация ранее намеченных гидроэнергетических проектов вполне отвечает как национальным, так и региональным интересам. Пандемия, маловодный год, снижение торговой и экономической активности стран показали необходимость сплоченности совместных усилий преодоления вызовов. В целях устойчивого развития энергетического сектора и восстановления экономики Кыргызстан и Узбекистан пришли к соглашению о обмене электроэнергии на взаимовыгодных условиях. Помимо межгосударственных соглашений, также существует договоренности различными международными финансовыми учреждениями по привлечению льготных кредитов на реконструкции и реализации энергетических проектов в Кыргызстане. Ранее в 2019-2020 году в республике были объявлены годами развития регионов, цифровизации и поддержки детей. Примером поступального экономического и социального развития страны и реализации намеченных программ, несмотря на пандемию, является своевременным переформатированием договоренности и соглашений с отдельными финансовыми институтами, выделение средств, которых предназначены на развитие сельской инфраструктуры, строительство систем водоснабжения, строительство ФАПов, школ, детских садов, спортивных сооружений и других социальных объектов. Негативные последствия пандемии требуют корреляции ранее разработанных стратегических национальных документов. В этой связи по поручению президента Кыргызской республики Садра Нургоджевича проводится анализ отчета по реализации национальной стратегии развития Кыргызстана на 18-40-е годы, а также подготовка пакетов основных реформ на среднесрочную перспективу и структурных реформ в экономике до 2026 года. Для поддержания населения, а также развития малого и среднего бизнеса со стороны коммерческих банков было предусмотрено льготные кредиты, 83% которые направлены на финансирование проектов в области республики. Вышеперечисленные и многое другое сейчас направлено на восстановление и дальнейшее устойчивое развитие страны. В завершение своего выступления хочу выразить благодарность всем участникам этого мероприятия и отметить важность подобных встреч для обмена опытом и мнения актуальным вопросом. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you to you for this useful information, Honorable Aydarov. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to the head of the national delegation of Croatia to PAM, Honorable Lubčka Maximuchuk, and I hope that I pronounce correctly your name. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to participate in today's meeting and I have only greet all the participants and would like to thank the experts for their input on the topics we are discussing today. Allow me to focus briefly on a few key details from the perspective of Croatia. Since Croatia is a member of the European Union, the work of the government and parliament is focused 
on the adoption of legislative initiative that are in line with the priority areas of the European institution for the period 2019-2024. Including economy development based on building a climate neutral, green, just and social Europe, as well as Europe's digital transition, which opens up new opportunities for citizens and business and strengthens the union's industrial and innovation capacity. Croatia also participates for the first time in the process adapting the long-term budget of the union for the period 2021-2027, which was finalized in December last year and accompanied by a package to support recovery from the crisis caused by COVID-19. Under the recovery and resilience facility, which is the instrument at the heart of the next generation EU and which aims to bust the recovery of economy from the COVID-19 pandemic, make it more resilient to future crises Croatia will have at disposal almost 9.4 billion euros. Croatian National Recovery and Resilience Plan 2020-2023 is a key document and its adoption is a condition for the use of funds from the European Recovery and Resilience Facility. We accept that a public consultation on this plan will start in the coming days before its discussion in parliament and uh, adoption in government session to the end of April, after which it will be sent to European Commission. The plan is based on six year, years, uh, the first being the economy with a focus in green and energy transition of Croatian economy. In addition to the coronavirus pandemic, Croatia is faced with the consequences of the devastating earthquakes last year, one in Zagreb and one in the area Banovina, with estimated damage of around 130 billion kuna. Six area of the plan will be important for us as well, which includes funds for the reconstruction of public and private buildings after earthquake. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a strong impact on the economy and the Croatian government adopted a number of the measures of safeguard the economy and to make the easier for the and temperance to do businesses and preserve jobs. As this, po this points, the most important for us all is the fight against the pandemic and procurement of a sufficient quantity of vaccine against COVID-19. Croatian ordered more vaccines from AstraZeneca than from other pharmaceutical companies switch. Given the delays in the production and delivery of vaccines from that company slowed down vaccination process in Croatia. Now we seek for solution to compensate for vaccine shortage. Dear colleagues, I'm convinced that the topics we are discussing today are on a agenda of all our parliament and given the importance not only at national but also at regional and global levels. It is necessary for us to continue cooperating and exchange, exchanging information and experience. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thanks a lot for your uh, interesting comments and now I have the pleasure 
to give the floor to Honorable Hamernan uh, Rakhmizanov from Kazakhstan. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Уважаемые участники, уважаемые коллеги, разрешите приветствовать всех участников сегодняшнего мероприятия. Оно является очень актуальным такой непростой мировой ситуации в условиях борьбы и восстановления от пандемии. В этих условиях особое значение мы продаем сотрудничеству братских стран, объединенных Тюркским Советом, а также принятой в рамках саммита глав государств декларации принятые в рамках саммита глав государств, нацеленные на оказание друг другу своевременной поддержки и укрепление солидарности между тюркскими народами. Справочно хотел бы сказать по итогам 2020 года, товарооборот Казахстана со странами Тюркского совета составил около 7 миллиардов, что на 11,2 ниже показателя предыдущего года. Экспорт из Казахстана в страны Тюркского совета за 2019 год снизился на 5,4%. Импорт снизился на 22,9%. Несомненно, у нас имеется большой потенциал для наращивания объемов взаимной торговли. В этой связи считаем необходимым продолжить совместную работу в данном направлении в этот нелегкий период для нас всех. Уважаемые дамы и господа, мы являемся свидетелем беспрецедентного многоуровневого кризиса мировой экономики. Введение чрезвычайного положения в 2020 году во многих странах из-за распространения COVID-19 привело к снижению мировых цен на нефть, а также рекордное падение фондовых индексов, которое негативным образом сказалось на развитии экономической системы как в мировой, так и в Республике Казахстан. Как мы видим по прогнозам, Международного валютного фонда мировой ВВП в 2021 году может повыситься лишь на 0,3%. В Казахстане по итогам 2020 года рост ВВП составил 97,4%. Инвестиции в основной капитал за 2020 год сократились на 3,4%. Инфляция на период январь 2021 года составила 7%. И 4 Текущая пандемия стала для нас уроком с точки зрения выявления слабых мест в международных поставках продовольственной продукции. Коронакризис заставил многие страны пересмотреть свои подходы по обеспечению продбезопасности с учетом текущих и вероятных внешних и внутренних шоков. Нашей совместной задачей должно стать коллективное формирование ряда новых буферов устойчивости текущему и возможным будущим кризисам. Казахстан приступил к разработке создания собственной товаропроводящей сети, состоящей из оптово-распределительных и агрологистических центров. В настоящее время во многих странах Центрально-Азиатского региона также активно ведется соответствующая работа. В этой связи считаем целесообразным рассмотреть возможность создания межгосударственной товаропроводящей системы. Уверен, что данная инициатива позволит максимально адаптировать к действующим национальным программам развития и преодолеть долгосрочные экономические последствия пандемии. Безусловно, ориентированность на конкретные сектора экономики повысит прежде всего эффективность данного проекта. Уважаемые коллеги, Текущий экономический кризис является не только вызовом для наших экономик, но и возможностью прежде всего. В этой связи сегодня, как никогда, важно активно использовать все преимущества межрегионального сотрудничества. Акцент на практическом содержании и совместных региональных проектах могут значительно повысить его продуктивность. Казахстан заинтересован в сотрудничестве с международными финансовыми институтами, Европейским банком реконструкции и развития, Азиатским банком развития, группой Всемирного банка, Международным валютным фондом и другими, при содействии которых сегодня на территории нашей страны реализуются крупные проекты, направленные на динамичное экономическое развитие Республики Казахстан. Мы намерены расширять наше стратегическое взаимодействие 
со Всемирной торговой организацией. В текущем году Казахстан является председателем 12-й министерской конференции ВТО, которая пройдет в Женеве в ноябре 2021 года. В рамках своего председательства наша страна намерена обеспечить значимые итоги предстоящей конференции и внести вклад в решение актуальных вопросов международной торговли. Убежден, что объединение наших усилий придаст мощный толчок к развитию нашего сотрудничества по самому широкому спектру направлений. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Rakhintanov. Indeed, your idea is excellent. The World Trade Organization is a very close partner of PAM. They even chair one of our committees, uh, the World Trade Organization. So I look forward to the chairmanship of your country and to deep further this cooperation. Thank you very much for, your inform for this information. Thanks a lot. Now, I have the pleasure to give the floor to a member of parliament from Tunisia, Honorable Jedidi Sebui. The floor is yours. Shukran. Shukran. Shukran, Sayyid Rais, Hadarat Sayyidat, Sayyid Al-Muhtarameen. Asmahu li fil bidaya an uwajiha tahiyya khalisa lishaab al-Filistini al-Munadhal. بمناسبة إحياء الذكرى السنوية الخامسة والأربعين ليوم الأرض تحت عنوان يوم الأرض عنوان الوحدة الوطنية وهي السبيل الوحيد لمواجهة الغطرسة الإسرائيلية سيداتي سادتي يشهد الاقتصاد التونسي تراجعا بنمو وصل إلى إلا ثمانية بسبب الظروف الصعبة التي يمر بها الاقتصاد الوطني ومخلفات جائحة كوفيد 19 وهو ما يحتم خطة إنعاش اقتصادي عاجلة بهدف تغيير منوال التنمية في البلاد وتعتبر المؤسسات الصغرى والمتوسطة محرك الاقتصاد في تونس باعتبارها باعتبار مساهمتها بقيمة 90% من الاقتصاد الوطني وما يعادل 30% من الضرائب إضافة إلى دورها في توظيف المئات من الشباب للحد من نسب البطالة لذا ندعو المنظمات الدولية وفي مقدمتها البنك الدولي والبنك الأوروبي وغيرها إلى المساهمة في تمويل المشاريع الصغرى والمتوسطة في تونس وأنقاذها من الصعوبات التي تشكو منها حتى تواصل نشاطها والمحافظة على طاقتها التشغيلية من خلال توفير التمويلات الضرورية ومنح قروض استثمارية لأصحاب سيداتي سادتي إن تونس تقدر الجهود التي بذلت تبذلها الجمعية البرلمانية البحر الأبيض المتوسط نظرا لما وفرته من معطيات ودراسات وما نظمته من اجتماعات للحوار والنقاش حول فيروس كوفيد 19 واسمحوا لي بهذه المناسبة أن أعبر عن شكري الخالص وامتناني للسيد الأمين العام للجمعية السيد سيرجيو بيرزي على مساعيه الطيبة واستعداده لتقديم الدعم الدبلوماسي للدول الأعضاء في الجمعية ومن بينهم تونس لمجابهة هذه الجائحة لقد تسلمت تونس الدفعة الأولى من اللقاح ضمن مبادرة كوفاكس خلال منتصف هذا الشهر إضافة إلى مبادرات أخرى بصدد التفعيل ورغم الاستقرار النسبي للوضع الوبائي في تونس خلال الأشهر القليلة الماضية فأن الكميات المتوفرة حاليا والتي سيتم تزويدها في المدة القادمة تبقى غير كافية وفي حاجة إلى التطوير لذا ندعو جميع أصدقائنا وفي مقدمتهم شركائنا في الضفة الشمالية المتوسط إلى دعم بلادنا وتوفير المزيد من اللقاحات والمعدات الطبية لمجابات هذه الجائحة وفي هذا الإطار نؤكد على أن التضامن العالمي ضروري لتوفير اللقاح بأسعار معقولة وأن يكون متاحا للجميع وندعو أن يكون التضامن حقيقي لاسيما في مجال المديونية وتخفيف الضغوط المالية والاقتصادية التي خلفتها هذه الجائحة بكافة دول العالم سيداتي سادتي لقد استثمرت الحكومة التونسية في الذكاء الاصطناعي لمواجهة جائحة كوفيد 19 منذ بدء تفشي هذا الفيروس في تونس حيث حدث تسابق بين الطلبة والعلماء للقيام بأبحاث وابتكارات دعم للأجهزة الصحة العامة ذات الإمكانيات المحدودة 
وقد نظمت الحكومة معرضا افتراضيا للعلوم والتكنولوجيا والإبداع تحت شعار صنع في تونس كما دخلت تونس عالم الصناعات الفضائية لأول مرة بإطلاق القمر الصناعي تحدي واحد من ك... من, أكخز... من كازاخستان يوم 22 مارس 2021 ويستعمل هذا القمر على تبادل المعطيات في عدة مجالات منها النقل والفلاحة والطقس وأشرفت على المشروع شركة نال التي سالت وعم... وعمل عليه مهندسون تونسيون شباب لمدة ثلاث سنوات لقد أولت تونس عناية كبيرة للابتكار والتكنولوجيا بهدف ضمان توافق سياسات الانتعاش الاقتصادي مع استراتيجيات التحول البيئي والرقمي حيث أطلقت وزارة الصناعة والمؤسسات الصغرى والمتوسطة التونسية خلال شهر سبتمبر 2020 سلسلة من الندوات بهدف تعميق التفكير في الحاجة إلى إعادة تركيز النمو الاقتصادي على الابتكار والتكنولوجيا وذلك بالتعاون مع مشروع النوفي الممول من قبل الاتحاد الأوروبي كما يعمل مركز تونس الدولي لتكنولوجيا البيئة على تعزيز وتكوين القدرات البشرية والمؤسساتية في مجال الحفاظ على البيئة للتصدي إلى التغيرات المناخية الخطيرة التي تهدد منطقة جنوب المتوسط خلال السنوات القادمة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this information. And now I give the floor to Honorable Abdivap Nurbaev from uh, Kyrgyz Republic. The floor is yours, sir. I, I think you have to switch on the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Уважаемые участники, уважаемые парламентарии, уважаемые коллеги, современный мир столкнулся с беспощадным бедствием под названием COVID-19, которое унесло больше 2,5 миллиона жизней и нанесло огромный ущерб мировой экономике. Так, по мнению экспертов, нас ожидает самый серьезный экономический кризис со времен Второй мировой войны. Эта болезнь не знает границ и различий по признаку расы, этнической, религиозной или гражданской принадлежности. Она затрагивает всех на своем пути и приводит к огромным страданиям людей, а также переворачивает их жизнь. Это прежде всего общечеловеческая беда, и она требует от нас совместного координированного действия для победы в борьбе с пандемией COVID-19. Уверен, что только коллективным усилием мы сможем одержать победу над этой болезнью и переодеть все его последствия. Тема данного заседания – межрегиональное сотрудничество и формирование устойчивого экономического восстановления – в нынешних условиях актуально, как никогда прежде. Согласно докладу ООН, в 2020 году мировая экономика сократилась на 4,3%, что более чем в 2,5 раза больше, чем во время глобального финансового кризиса 2009 года. Ожидаемое в 2021 году умеренное восстановление в размере 4,7% едва ли компенсирует убытки от экономического последствия коронавируса. Этот беспрецедентный кризис унес в жизни более 2,5 миллиона человек, который обрек огромность, что семей на нищету, усугубил неравенство доходов, нарушил международную торговлю и парализовал мировые экономики, требует немедленного принятия встречаемых мер на восстановление мировой экономики. И одним из ключевых инструментов восстановления мировой экономики и создания стабильного, а также более справедливого будущего для всех людей мы видим достижение целей устойчивого развития. Уверен, что тесное сотрудничество в достижении повестки дня в область, в область устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года приведет нас к более светлому будущему. Цель устойчивого развития – это шаги к достижению стабильного прогресса и справедливости в мире, которые содержат ряд целей и задач, направленных на ликвидацию нищеты, неравенства и обеспечение благополучия для всех. Данная повестка предусматривает мир, в котором полностью соблюдены права человека – Уважается человеческое достоинство, есть все условия для полноценного развития. Пандемия показала, что ситуация с распространением коронавируса усугубляется нищетой, голодом, слабыми системами здравоохранения, отсутствием чистой воды, санитарии, необразованностью и глобальной разобщенностью. Хотя цель устойчивого развития и не интегрирована в борьбе с COVID-19 с последствиями, мы уверены, что в процессе реализации задач ЦУ сможем не только снизить негативные последствия пандемии, но и добиться 
определенных успехов в дальнейшем развитии наших стран. Например, сеть номер 6 – это чистая вода и санитария. Один из самых эффективных способов снизить уровень распространения вируса – это частое мытье рук или обработка их антисептическим гелем. На 3 миллиарда людей во всем мире не имеют доступа к базовым средствам гигиены. Отсутствие, отсутствие доступа к чистой воде приводит к повышенной уязвимости перед болезнями и отрицательным, для, отрицательным влияет на, на иммунитет. Или цель номер 8. Достойно работа экономического роста. Согласно предварительным данным, примерно 25 миллионов людей во всем мире могут потерять работу из-за экономического кризиса, вызванного пандемией COVID-19. И этот кризис показал необходимость переосмысления существующей системы и выявить все его уязвимости и в дальнейшем выработать более крепкую систему экономики для защиты работников и предприятий от негативных внешних факторов. Уважаемые участники, в июле 2018 года была образована рабочая группа парламента Кыргызской Республики по контролю и исполнению законодательств по реализации целей устойчивого развития в Кыргызстане. Рабочая группа, которая состоит из депутатов из всех фракций и всех комитетов, направлена в первую очередь на законодательную поддержку реализации ЦУР. В рамках данной рабочей группы с участием представителей бизнеса, гражданского сообщества и международных организаций обсуждались вопросы повышения вовлеченности парламента в достижение ЦУР. В частности, в рамках рабочей группы был обсужден законопроект о, при... о внесении изменений в некоторые законодательные акты Крымской Республики по вопросам поддержки инвестиций, ориентированных на достижение ЦУР номер 8 и 16. Также при непосредственном усилии рабочей группы был подготовлен национальный добровольный обзор достижения СУР Кыргызской Республики 2020, который был представлен мировым сообществом в июле 2020 года. Согласно национальному добровольному обзору достижения СУР КР 2020, цели устойчивого развития включены в государственную политику и отражены в национальной стратегии развития Кыргызской Республики на 2018-2040 годы. В программе правительства Хыргызской Республики «Единство доверия создания» на период 2018-2022 года, основ которых был заложен человеко концентрированный подход. Концептуальная идея стратегии до 2040 года является обеспечением высокого качества и достойного уровня жизни человека в рамках, в рамках концепции устойчивого экономического роста. Русская республика придерживается глобального реализации, не оставит никого позади, с особым акцентом и приоритетным вниманием к наиболее уязвимым группам населения. Для достижения устойчивого, цели устойчивого развития в 2030 году Крымская республика установила ключевой, ключевой приоритет – ориентированность политики, населенной на развитие человека. Для этого реализуются национальные планы по обеспечению гарантий правовой и судебной защиты прав и свобод человека – Гражданина, сокращение неравенства, искоренение бедности, смягчение последствий изменения климата, снижение риска бедствий, инвестирование в человеческое развитие, формирование навыков и знаний для всех слоев общества, создание рабочих мест и поддержка здорового образа жизни, продвижение гендерного равенства. В стране практически ликвидирована крайняя бедность. Общее образование бесплатно, общее доступное обязательно. Кыргызская республика одно из первых полностью решила проблему без гражданства, без гражданства. Это касается отдельных лиц и общества в целом, позволяет применять все объемлющие и преобразующие характер целей устойчивого развития для обеспечения политического участия, расширения экономических прав и возможностей социального развития всех слоев общества. С начала реализации СУР КР Кыргызская республика ратифицировала ряд важных международных соглашений, среди которых Конвенция ООН о правах инвалидов и Парижское соглашение об изменении климата, обеспечивающие дополнительные возможности для расширения прогресса в расширении целей устойчивого развития. Уважаемые, уважаемые дамы и господа, во благо наших народов нам необходимо тесное сотрудничество между нашими странами для достижения ЦУР и вследствие преодолеть негативные последствия кризиса, а также положить начало экономическому восстановлению. В этой связи приветствую усилия парламентской ассамблеи Курпа и парламентской ассамблеи Средиземное море, организации межрегиональных площадок для обмена мнений по актуальным вопросам. Выражаю надежду на дальнейшее обсуждение в рамках совместных заседаний. Выражаю уверенность, что повестка дня данного мероприятия и обсуждения внесет вклад в создание и усовершенствование механизмов и инструментов и инструмент по основанию мировой экономики. Благодарю за внимание.
Thank you very much. Thank you to you very much. I, because we have to close in 15 minutes, I ask kindly the next speakers to limit that intervention to two minutes. Uh, on my list, the next one is Honorable Ali Latif Almisned from the Shura Council of Qatar. And after him will be Honorable Bilal Qasem from Palestine. Uh, sir, Engineer Alman said, you have the floor. Uh, microphone, you have to unmute the microphone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Shukran Sa'adat al-Rais. Wa shukur mawthul. إلى زملائي وزميلاتي أعضاء البرلمانيين وهي فرصة كبيرة جدا لنا من مجلس الشورى الغطري أن أشارككم في هذا اللقاء الهام وأيضا نتبادل معكم تجاربنا فيما يتعلق في جائحة كورونا وأيضا فيما يتعلق بالوضع الاقتصادي بشكل عام. I don't I, I, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, طبعا قطر uh, هي جزء من العالم وتأثرت uh, يعني كل دول العالم تأثرت بدرجات متفاوتة فيما يتعلق بجائحة كورونا uh, ونتمنى إن شاء الله السلامة للجميع. Uh, كما يعلم الجميع بأن قطر تعتمد اعتماد كبير جدا في اقتصادها على على على تصدير البترول ومشتقاته وأيضا على الغاز وللأسف الشديد في خلال تلك الفترة وما خلال فترة بداية جائحة كورونا تم يعني انخفاض أسعار النفط بشكل كبير في العالم مما أثر فعلا على يعني الاقتصاد والتزامات الدولة ولكن ولله الحمد مع بداية الأزمة مباشرة وجهت الحكومة حزمة اقتصادية كبيرة قيمتها أكثر من 50 مليار دولار لمساعدة القطاع الخاص وخاصة القطاع الصغير والمتوسط لمواجهة هذه الجائحة هذا من جانب ومن جانب آخر قامت الدولة بتبني استمرار كافة موظفيها ومكتسباتها الوطنية وتم أيضا فيما يتعلق بالجانب الخدمات الصحية قدمت قطر يعني برامج الخدمة الصحية وهي من الدول المتقدمة في تطبيق التحسينات أو التطعيمات الصحية ووصلنا إلى حد الآن أكثر من 750 ألف شخص يعني أي ما يقارب تقريبا يعني 40 إلى 50% من سكان قطر يعني وصلوا من التطعيم على مرحلتين طبعا أنا ودي أن أتشارك معكم في أهم تحدي يعني موجود وكما يعلم الجميع بأن قطر سوف تستضيف مناسبة كبيرة جدا مناسبة عالمية وهي مناسبة كأس العالم في 2022 وهذا كما يعلم الجميع بأن على قطر أن تلتزم بتنفيذ كافة برامجها والتحضير لكأس العالم و يعني الفتره كانت فعلا تحدي كبير بحيث ان يعني عندنا جائحه كورونا في عندنا لوك داون او في عدم امكانيه يعني الخروج من المنازل وفي نفس الوقت كافه المغاولين عليهم الالتزام بتنفيذ المشاريع فالتحدي كان كبير جدا ولكن والحمد لله بتضافر الجهود لم يتم التاخير نهائيا في تنفيذ البرامج بل بالعكس يعني بالتنسيق يعني أهم يمكن معلم في هذه التجربة هي التنسيق المباشر بين كافة أطراف 
بين كافة أطراف الحكومة وأيضا المتابعة المستمرة مباشرة من رئاسة مجلس الوزراء بما يتعلق بتنفيذ كافة مشاريع ومتطلبات كأس العالم وخذنا يعني شهادة أيضا من الفيفا بأن قطر على برامجها التي تمت الاتفاق عليها باستمرار وبنجاح كامل فمن هذه الزاوية أيضا إن شاء الله نرحب بالجميع في هذه المناسبة إن شاء الله القادمة ونتمنى إن شاء الله في في في, في قبل ذلك الوقت أن أن أن يعني أن أن أن, أن يكون العالم بخير وبسلام طبعا احنا ايضا على استعداد تام في المشاركه بما كسبته يعني الدول من خبرات وايضا المشاركه وتبادل الخبرات بين بين دول الاعضاء شكرا جزيلا thank you very much for your contribution uh... Little change, I have on the floor now Honorable Akdag from Turkey and he will be followed by Honorable Bilal from Palestine. Honorable Akdag, the floor is yours. A microphone, please. On... Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deli Başkan. Size ve bütün katılımcılara saygılarımı takdim ediyorum. Vaktin kısıtlı olmasından dolayı konuşmamın en çarpıcı bölümlerini sizlere takdim edeceğim. Ben 11 yılı aşkın bir süre e, Türkiye'de Sağlık Bakanlığı yaptım. Ve böyle başka salgınlar da yaşadık bu kadar e, zor olmasa da. E, Türkiye olarak biz bu salgına gerçekten hazırdık. Hem altyapımız itibariyle hem de e, eylem planlarımız itibariyle salgını göğüsleyebildik. Evet. Ama COVID-19 e, salgını ortak bir sorun. Dünya olarak bunun ne kadar farkındaydık? Hatta ne kadar farkındayız? Bana göre pek farkında değildik. Şu anda bile tam da farkında değiliz. Kurallara dayalı uluslararası sistem maalesef küresel yönetim itibariyle COVID-19 sırasında yetersiz kaldı. Bir örnek olarak söyleyeyim. Birleşmiş Milletler salgını gündemine 100 günde ancak alabildi. Biz Türkiye olarak uluslararası dayanışmaya başından beri katkı verdik. Biraz önce değerli milletvekilimiz Sayın Uslu da ifade ettiler. 107 ülkeye katkı vermiş durumdayız. Şunu söylemeliyim ki yalnızca kendi ülkesini kurtarma çabası doğru bir çaba değil bu salgınlar sırasında. Evet bazı ülkelerde vaka sayısı ve ölüm sayıları itibariyle daha az sayılar görüldü. Ancak global güvensizlik ortamı ve ekonomik gerilemeden o ülkelerde Maalesef olumsuz biçimde nasibini aldılar. Şu ana kadar dünyada 3 milyona yakın ölüm var. Bunun üçte biri 5 e, e, adet G20 ülkesinde. Enteresan değil mi bu sizce? Amerikan Birleşik Devletleri, İngiltere, Fransa, İtalya ve Almanya'da 1 milyona yakın ölüm var. Toplam ölümlerin üçte biri. Demek ki hani ben zengin ülkeyim, ben bu işten kendi başıma çıkarım düşüncesi Son derece yanlış bir düşünce. Burada IMF'den, Avrupa Yatırım Bankası'ndan, OECD'den, Birleşmiş Milletler'in çeşitli kuruluşlarından arkadaşlarımız var bizimle birlikte. Bence hepimiz, işte birkaç parlamenter asemble, asemblemesinden arkadaşlar burada birlikteyiz. Biz artık uluslararası toplumu bu gerçekte yüzleştirmek için gayret sarf etmeliyiz. Yani kendi başına bir pandemiden çıkmak diye bir şey yok. Birleşmiş Milletler çatısı altında yeni ve özel bir mekanizma oluşturulmalı. Konunun sağlık ve ekonomik yönlerini birlikte ele almalı bu mekanizma. E, finans kaynağı da bunun hazır olmalı. Hangi ülkede bu ortaya çıktıysa bir task force oraya hızla gitmeli ve ülkeler bilmeli ki şeffaf bir biçimde ben destek alırım. Ben ekonomik destek alırım. Ben sağlık açısından teknik destek alırım. O zaman ülkeler bunu saklamaz, gizlemez. Şeffaf bir biçimde başından mesele dünyaya yayılmadan önleme imkanımız olabilir. Aşı konusu da çok kritik elbette. Bazı ülkelerin aşı satışına sınırlamalar getirme çabasını çok yanlış buluyorum. Bu insani de değil. Biz şahsen Türkiye olarak 100 milyon doz üzerinde anlaşma yapmış durumdayız. Bu bahar mevsimi bittiğinde nüfusumuzun %60'ını da aşılamış olacağız. 
Yani ülke olarak çok büyük sıkıntımız olmayacak ama dünyaya baktığımız zaman büyük bir sıkıntı görüyoruz. Bu arada 5 ada aşı adayımız Türkiye'de klinik çalışma safhasına geldi. Bunların içinde birisi intranazal yani burun içerisine spreyle yapılan bir aşı. Bu aşıyı çok böyle kit, büyük miktarlarda üretme imkanı da var. Öyle ümit ediyorum ki bahsettiğim aşı bu yıl içinde geliştirilebilirse bütün dünyaya da Türkiye olarak bu açıdan katkı vermiş olabileceğiz. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Thank you very much, Honorable Akdak. Very interesting. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to the Honorable uh, Belal Kasem from Palestine, Vice President of Palm. Bilal, the floor is yours. Microphone, yes. Shukran jazilan, Sadiqi, Sergio. U bidayatan atakaddam bil shukur wa takdir ila kul man saham bil adad li hadha al-liqa al-muhim لتعزيز التعاون والعمل بين جمعيتنا وجمعية الناطقة بالتركية وبرلمان دول البحر الأسود وأشكر جميع المتحدثين والخبراء على محاضراتهم القيمة والمفيدة جدا وأشكر أخي ممثل تونس على تحيته لشعبنا الفلسطيني في ذكرى يوم الأرض وفيما يخصنا نحن في الأراضي الفلسطينية المحتلة عانى شعبنا الفلسطيني كثيرا من هذه الجائحة كوفيد 19 وما زلنا نعاني من الوصول إلى اللقاحات والتي وصلت بكميات قليلة ومتأخرة للأسف وهذا بسبب استمرار سلطات الاحتلال الإسرائيلي بعاقة وصول هذه اللقاحات إلى الجهات الفلسطينية المختصة ومن هنا وضعت الحكومة الفلسطينية خطة وطنية تحت عنوان الصمود المقاوم لمواجهة هذه الجائحة وتستمر بجهودها من أجل حلول جذرية في معركتها ضد الجائحة وضد استمرار قطعان المستوطنين الذين يستمرون باعتداءاتهم اليومية على شعبنا ضد الزراعة وتلويث المياه وضد الاقتصاد والتجارة وبحماية كاملة من جنود الاحتلال الإسرائيلي ومن هنا نحن نواجه نوعان من الوباء وباء سياسي واحتلال ووباء كورونا ومن جهة ثانية نتقدم بالشكر لكل من ساهم ودعم وصول اللقاحات إلى أبناء شعبنا لرفع المعاناة عنه وكما قال الدكتور كابيلا والدكتور بيلو بيدرو صديقي إن الركيزة الأساسية لمقاومة الجائحة يجب أن تكون بالتعاون وأن يكون الجميع بأمان وعدم تسييس وصول اللقاحات كما تقوم الحكومة الإسرائيلية بذلك لذلك علينا أن نعمل يد بيد لمواجهة هذه الجائحة ومن وبتقديري أن هذا اللقاء مهم جدا جدا ويؤسس لعمل وتعاون مستقبلي بين دولنا وبين شعوبنا لمواجهة هذه الجائحة على كافة الأصعدة الاقتصادية والتجارية ونحن على استعداد تام للتعاون مع الجميع وشكرا Thank you very much Thanks a lot for uh, Bilal for your contribution Thanks a lot Now I have on, on the list as the next speaker, uh, Honorable Glamuzina Katica from Croatia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Piazzi, and greetings to the distinguished audience from the Croatian part of the Mediterranean. As a member of the EU and in accordance with the priorities of the European institutions, Croatia is aligning its own legal system and is setting measures and initiatives to contribute to a climatically neutral, green, just and social Europe. Our goal as a union is clear, to become a global leader of the green economy and entice other countries to boost their efforts in a fight against climate change. The best way to achieve that goal is by combining the union's initiatives and consistent national policies established in the integrated national energy and climate plans. 
Just like other EU member states, Croatia has prepared our own integrated national energy and climate plan for the period of 2021 to 2030, clearly stating our plans concerning the integrated vision of the energy and climate transition in the next 10 years, keeping in mind the five national targets, which are decarbonization, energy efficiency, energy security, internal energy market, and research innovation and competitiveness. The integrated national energy and climate plan builds on existing national strategies and plans. It provides an overview of the current energy system and the energy and climate policy, as well as an overview of the national targets for each of the five key dimensions of the energy union and the corresponding policies and measures to achieve those targets. Particular attention is given to the 2030 targets, which include the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, sustainable energy from renewable sources, energy efficiency and electricity interconnection. It should be ensured that the integrated energy and climate plan is consistent with and contributes to the sustainable development goals. Considering all the numerous climate and ecological challenges that we're exposed to on the national, regional and global level, it is necessary to take immediate measures towards changes that are needed in order to preserve our planet. Those changes will not be possible without the cross-sectoral communication and joint actions of science, politics, the civil society and the private sector on all levels. Finally, given that I don't see too many women in this panel, let me address one more issue, which has recently been continuously emphasized by the Secretary General of the UN and has also been discussed in panels in the EU. It concerns the gender inequality of the COVID pandemic effect. Um, in order to be brief and to the point, I will paraphrase Mr. Antonio Guterres. The COVID pandemic has erased decades of progress towards gender equality. As a result of the COVID pandemic, escalating crises of domestic violence, disrupted schooling, job losses, exploding burdens of unpaid care have all affected women far more than men. Women's lives have been upended and their rights eroded, the consequences of which will far outlast the epidemic. As we recover from the pandemic, support and stimulus packages must target women and girls specifically, including through investments in women-owned businesses and the care economy. The national recovery plans must include measures towards gender equality. It is time to build an equal future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to you. Thank, thanks a lot. And uh, you give me the opportunity to say that FAM is very committed to this. You are totally right. And uh, at the last meeting of our bureau, thanks to all the information we collected, it has been decided to create the FAM Women Parliamentary Forum. And uh, this is extremely important and also there is a proposal by the delegation of Italy to amend the statute of FAM to ensure that at least one member of the delegation must be from the other gender, really to push something which is already included in our statutes. This is, this is extremely important and I wish to thank you for uh, reminding this uh, to us. Now, I have the, another member of parliament from Tunisia, and I have the pleasure to give the floor to Honorable Kenza Ajala. The floor is yours. Shukran. Shukran. Shukran. هل yes, الصوت واضح؟ yes. شكرا شكرا على إتاحة الفرصة من خلال هذا المنبر لكم جميعا في الجمعية البرلمانية المتوسط والجمعية البرلمانية لدول ناطقة بتركيا باللغة التركية تحية صادقة للحضور في 30 مارس 2021 اسمحوا لي أيضا أنا سوق تحية حب لكل الشعوب المحبة للسلام والحرية والديمقراطية وأخص الشعب الفلسطيني في الذكرى 45 يوم الأرض موضوع التعاون الإقليمي ودورة الانتعاز الاقتصادي طرحه هام جدا والعالم بدأ خطواته الأولى في التعافي من جائحة كورونا التي كان لها أثر سلبي كبير جدا على تونس وخاصة على الاقتصاد التونسي 
الذي شهد انكماشا تجاوز 22% كما تراجع الناتج المحلي بأكثر من 20% تراجع النمو إلى إلا 8% كلفة كورونا 1.8 مليار دولار تضرر المؤسسات الصغرى والمتوسطة التي تساهم ب 90% من النسيج الاقتصادي الوطني وغيرها من الأضرار ليس من السهل وضع خطة انتعاش اقتصادي بدون مساعدة المنظمات الدولية والأصدقاء والأشقاء مساعدتنا خاصة في الاستثمار ونحتاج لتمويل مشاريعنا الصغرى والمتوسطة استثمرت تونس في الحقيقة في الاقتصاد الأخضر والرقمي وبذلت في ذلك جهود وشجعت بشكل كبير جدا الطلبة والعلماء على الأبحاث والابتكارات ودعموا الصحة خاصة بالتجهيزات دخلت تونس عالم الصناعة الفضائية وأطلقت القمر الصناعي تحدي واحد شالنج وان في كازاخستان يوم 22-23 وتحية هنا إلى المهندس محمد الفريخة وكل المهندسين الذين كانوا معه على رأس هذا الإنجاز التضامن الدولي لتوفير اللقاحات هو أيضا يشغل الجميع وحي جهود الجمعية البرلمانية المتوسط من بما قامت به من أجل ذلك وحاليا تونس تلقينا دفعة أولى من تلقيح ضمن مبادرة كوفاكس لكن ذلك غير كاف نحتاج وأدعوكم هنا بكل لطف إلى دعم الشعب التونسي باللقاحات والمعدات تونس أيضا بذلت جهود كبيرة في الاستثمار في لدعم المؤسسات الصغرى من خلال سلسلة من الندوات وسلسلة من البرامج في إطار مشروع إنوفي الممول من قبل الاتحاد الأوروبي الذي نحييه وتحية لكم جميعا على ما قدمتموه وإلى اللقاء Thank you. Shukran Jasila. Thanks a lot. Uh, very kind, excellent support. And uh, listen, I have to close the list now. The, I have to mention that not only member of parliament, but also private sector is associated to this meeting today, including the financial institutions. And uh, among us, you will see Mr. Ofer Berzak, he is one of the top experts from uh, Israel about food security and fishery. And uh, he is leading with the PAM, with the United Nations, and with all your countries a very interesting experimental project to increase the capacity of our food security without depleting the resources of our sea, of our lake, and our rivers. And uh, because of time, uh, I cannot give him the floor, but I wish to thank him for being there and to continue to support the efforts of PAM and all our, uh, all our countries. I know that Turkey is very active in the project, and I wish to thank also Turkey for that. Now, I have to move to the conclusions. And I would like to start by offering my sincere gratitude to our guests, our experts, all the delegates who attended the meeting today. A special thanks to the Secretary General of Turk PA, uh, Mr. Maimaisupov, and all the colleagues from his office who collaborated with us and with the PubSec to make sure that this meeting is useful, is constructive, which provide good ideas, good food for toads, for all of you, and show the way ahead. And we have heard that we have a number of meetings set, one hosted by Tarki in Antalya in October, another one with a colleague from PubSec, Turk PA, and I think we have to invite also all the colleagues from the Arab Parliament on the key issue of tourism. This is life for us, for all our countries. I also see our colleagues from uh, the Baltic Assembly and uh, the Secretary General both are very nice sent me a message saying this, message, this meeting today is very interesting. Let's do something together similar. And the answer is a yes, indeed, is extremely useful. And I wish to thank you for that. 
you will see today we put together delegations from Portugal to Kazakhstan, all the Middle East, all the Maghreb, Mashgreb, Europe, we can work together. We have the duty to work together. Economic recovery from COVID is not a national issue that no country can afford alone and isolation. The success of our neighbor is our success and we have to work it together. I would also refer to what has been said in terms of policy of investment, support to the medium and small size enterprises, support to the informal jobs, which are so many in our countries. We, I wish also to refer to the question of vaccination. Uh, as it has been mentioned, no one will be safe until everyone is vaccinated. And this is true for all our country because our economies, our societies are totally integrated. And you see under the world the tourism, how much it means for all of us, the opening of the borders and the capacity to travel. This is what I would like to summarize with this meeting. And I would really close again the event with my warmest thanks for the precious contribution by our delegates. All of you spoke with wisdom. You know what the, the problem is. You know how to address it. And you can count on the secretariat of our assemblies, of our parliamentary assemblies, to provide you with the information you may need, any facilitation role. You see, we have excellent contact with the World Bank, European Investment Bank, Islamic Finance, World Trade Organization, the United Nations System, UNIDO. We can help to provide this additional platform of, of information, of contacts, of data, to our constituencies. This is our job and speaking on behalf of the Secretary General of the other assemblies, we are happy to do so, we are ready to do so. It is needed. Today, we set up the building block for a new multilateral and integrated response to this crisis. Parliamentary diplomacy has a key role to play in that. A U are the main actor of this strategy, of this approach, of this tool. As PAM, we look forward to continuing this path with our parliamentarians, with your parliamentarians, with all the partners in the international institution and the private sector toward the resilient and recovery across all our regions. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us and I wish